Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am one of your hosts for today, John DeLynn. Today, we are going to be dealing with a very important and sensitive topic. We're going to be dealing about, we're, we're going to be dealing with multi generational child abuse within a Mormon context. So what it's like to experience child abuse, in this case, from a, a man's point of view, from a boy's point of view, what it's like to experience uh, child abuse in a Mormon context, along with, we'll say, harmful sexual messages around shame and, and worth and that sort of thing, um, how that plays into an adolescence in, a, in an adulthood. Uh, that's all going to be kind of part one of today's episode. And then part two is going to be what happens when you survive Mormonism, live the Mormon dream, get married in the temple, and then as a abuse survivor yourself, your one of your children experiences abuse within the Mormon context. So that's the multi-generational abuse part. I'm hitting uh, that hard from the start so that everybody knows uh, to practice self-care, so that everyone knows we're going to be talking about very sensitive issues um, and, and it's timely because in the past five to 10 years, uh, instances of M Mormon child abuse and cover-ups of Mormon child abuse are rampant. Just yesterday, there was a ruling out of California where the Mormon church was, uh, in implicated in a $2 billion, uh, child abuse verdict. Uh, and there's, I, I have a lot more to learn about that subject, but it's a very timely topic. It's a sensitive topic. And here as my co-pilot for today's episode is my dear partner, Margie. Hey, Margie. Hi there. It's good to have you. Mm, grateful to be here. Yeah. And the the people that we're interviewing today are from Southern California. They are Jared and Ashley Jones. Hey, guys. Hi. Hi. Thanks for coming all the way here to do a Mormon Stories interview. We're happy to be here. Yeah. And thanks for being willing to talk about something so sensitive yeah. and so, so uh, important. Yeah. Yeah. Before we actually launch into your story, do either of you want to set an intention? In other words, talk about why, why you're here. A, a lot of times people make false assumptions about why someone would come on a podcast like this and talk openly. So it's a way to say this is not why we're here, and this is why we're here. Does that? And and if you if you'd rather just tell your story, that's fine too. Well, I mean, from my perspective, um, I I guess I'd start out by saying like my major reason for wanting to come on and talk and share my story is if I could. Um, go back and sorry, I'm going to be emotional throughout this. Um, if I could go back and talk to younger Jared, um, I would have so much love and empathy. And there, there really is so much, um, that has gone on throughout my life that, um, now I can look back and I can say, Hey man, you were a good guy. You were trying hard. You know, you love people. Uh, you love God. And um, you're worthy. You're a good person. Like, and so that being able to communicate with other people that maybe have similar experiences to me and being able to help them, you know, from a perspective of saying, gosh, I am, I'm a good person. I am worthy. Um, I, that is the major thing that I, I want to communicate because as I've, as I've gone throughout my life in the church, um, you know, that hasn't always been the case. I haven't always felt that way. And so that's really for me, um, a major theme that I'd, I'd love to express and communicate. Yeah. I mean, for me, like for coming on, I know when this first happened with our daughter being abused and dealing with all the church leaders, I heard a lot of like, that That wouldn't really happen. That's not what goes on in the church. Like, that's not how they deal with it. Like, you must be misunderstanding. And it was helpful to hear other people who experience the same thing to be like, no, like, we're not crazy. Like, this is not just because we're making a big deal out of something. And yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So to let people know this is real yeah. and this happens and that they're not alone or crazy if, if they've experienced it. Yeah. 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 I often say silence is the enabler and silence is the killer, right? Yeah. 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 But it's also very taboo within a Mormon context to talk openly about problems. They, I remember general conference talk once about dirty laundry and you don't air dirty laundry publicly. So it's a very courageous act. It may sound simple, but I think Margie and I know that what you're doing is mm -hmm. very courageous. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think so. We're going to do this in two parts. Part one is going to be, um, we're going to be focusing on Jared's story mostly, but, but we'll incorporate Ashley's story as much as Ashley wants to share. That's not <laughs> us showing a preference. It's more just how the interview has been envisioned by, by Jared and Ashley. So we'll be talking about your Mormon upbringings, the abuse, the sexual shame, adolescence and adulthood in your, in your marriage up until the point where your own, child experienced abuse that will be part one and how how these themes played out throughout that entire time period then we'll stop and then we'll come back for a part two where we talk about uh your child's abuse uh how it was dealt with in your ward and stake and then how that led to your own faith journeys is that does that sound right yeah yeah yeah, yeah okay. that's right okay all right. Well, uh, so Jared, where does your, how, what would you like to share about your Mormon upbringing? So, um, you know, I, I look back at my life, um, for the highs and lows. And I mean, truly, um, from a perspective of privilege, from a perspective of like, you know, where, where I come from, like I won the lottery, like, um, I grew up in sunny Southern California with a big family. Um, you know, I grew up in Riverside and I grew up in the idyllic stake. Um, we, our, our area was always well populated it was kind of like a mecca for families to move from Orange County because they couldn't quite afford there. And so, so many of our friends and family members grew up in like that five or six person or five or six child family. So we just had lots of friends to play with, uh, grew up in orange groves and ran around and um, threw oranges at each other and at cars and all the fun things. Um, you know, my parents were very involved and loving. Um, and, you know, I, I have lots of positive childhood memories. Um, my dad was somehow always involved in leadership in the church. And so, you know, um, he was always well respected. He was, uh, my dad's kind of a, um, a polarizing guy, I guess you could say a lot of people really love him. And there's quite a few people that don't as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, you know, from a perspective, the church, like he was always all in and so was my mom. Um, and so they, they just, they did a great job and as best as they could in every scenario that they could, they always had love, um, you know, for the kids and, um, so I have four brothers and one sister, uh, my sister being the youngest. And, uh, you know, it was, it was awesome growing up with a big family. I always enjoyed that. That was always something that I kind of wanted for myself. And that's definitely manifested in our lives. Um, and so like the, the stake that I grew up in was called the Riverside West stake. And like I said, it was booming. We had amazing youth programs and youth conferences. And, um, so, you know, growing up in that area, um, was great. We always had friends. We always had activities. Um, you know, 
my parents were involved from a perspective of like um, we would have activities at our house, like we would church activities. Church activities, yep. Um, they built a big pool, um, and so we, you could have all the youth over at the same time, and we, you know, big. Uh, water slide and, uh, you know, things like that. And so anyway, it's just, it was fun. Um, yeah, one thing that was um, modeled for me um, as a child is that, like, if the church needs anything, like, you give. Like, it, my dad was an entrepreneur, very successful um, at what he did. He's in private investigation in the legal service business. Um, and, you know, from probably the time that I was, I don't know, like eight or nine, something like that, um, money was not like an issue. And my dad always connected with the church from a perspective of like, hey, if, yeah, like if the leaders ask, you give, you give until it hurts, like whatever that is, like you just, you do. It's, you know, he definitely believed in consecration. And so, that didn't just manifest when the bishop would ask for a handout, like when it was time to do a high adventure or something like that, and there wasn't something fun to do. He would go buy sea dews and take them to the river, and then you know he'd have them for a year and a half and realize that we didn't actually really use them, uh, and so then he'd sell them. And but like that, that kind of a thing was always a theme growing up. Is like um, he was always generous to fault. And um, so that meant that there were a lot of activities that took place at our house. That meant that there were a lot of activities that he sponsored. Um, and so as I was a child, I remember a lot of people um, would say wonderful things about my dad and also some hateful things um, from that perspective of like, oh, yeah, your dad thinks he's cool, so he's, you know, he's doing this to show off or whatever. And when truly, like, 100% out of the goodness of his heart, but at the same time, I saw that, and I idolized it, right? And I'm like, man, my dad is the guy. Like, he is the guy that lives um, what he believes. He's willing to give everything all the time. And so that as I was like formulating what I wanted out of life for myself, for my family, for my children, like that was the dream. Mm. Like, so I, I loved it. Like he was always super giving, um, you know, and so from my perspective as a child growing up in the church, like with dad as a bishop and the high council as a young men's leader, like all the different things that he did, like that was what, that was what was modeled. And that's what I wanted to be. Was it a, was, was your mom a traditional Mormon state home mom or? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Very, very traditional in that respect. Like, and for sure, like the, the way that I grew up thinking, like that's a huge badge of honor, right? Like, not and you know I remember my dad tells a story a lot about how um, when they were on their way to the temple uh, to get married in L.A. Now they they were um, they were the only active members at the time that they got married in the L.A. temple, um, and. Basically, they the had active members of their, their immediate families. Of their immediate families. So they went by oh. themselves to the temple. Oh, wow. Right. Were they, they weren't converts, though. No. Um, my grandma on my dad's side um, was, uh, she was converted as a child um, and had a, like, a so not kind pioneer of a, ancestry on your dad's side. Not on, okay. not on my dad's okay. side. Um, and then on my mom's side, it, there was pioneer ancestry. And so I think I'm sixth generation. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, but at the time my mom's, uh, mom and her stepdad, yeah, stepdad, um, was, were not active in the church. Okay. And so anyways, they go to the temple by themselves on the way to the temple, um, you know, they had decided that she would work until they had kids. Well, um, 
she's like, well, I've decided that I'm going to become a homemaker now. And so I, I gave notice the other day and I, I've quit my job. And so my dad's like, well, what, what option did I have? <laughs> you know, he's like, I was ready to get married. Um, and so he, you know, he's like, so when I got back from our honeymoon, uh, I went and got another job. Like, so he talks about um, how he had three jobs. And so, like I said, like that badge of honor, like he, he he knew his part. He played it well, and he's a hard worker, and always has been. And so for me, um, you know, like that was definitely modeled. And and yes, that that's my mom did that, and she had God bless her. She had five boys. Um, it, the majority of the time uh, that I was growing up, my little sister came a little bit later. She's 10 years younger than me. Caboose. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so like a blessing, like to my family, like that was definitely what they, they had talked about is they've been trying for a girl and, you know, there's the story of how our family, um, like we fasted, um, and prayed that we would have, um, you know, this little sister, this daughter, um, in the family. And so, yeah, that, that was the case. Um, and, but yeah, I mean, my mom had, we were hellions. I mean, like the, my dad talked about like when he went to school, um, as a teenager, how he would get in fights all the time. Like that was kind of like, and, you know, so, for us in our family, like being physical was okay. Like it was okay to hit people. It was okay to, <laughs> you know, I mean, right. Like justifiably. So like, that's the, that's what the narrative was like that. Definitely not the narrative in my wife's family. Like <laughs> you do not touch other people. You don't hit people like, you know, but if you're defending yourself, if you're defending your principles or whatever, fighting is totally cool. Like it's totally fine, and so that was that was the kind of situation that my mom was managing with all of her five boys. We would get in fights all the time, and we get at fights at school and those kind of things. And you know, so that was that was what my mom had to deal with. And my do you my remember mom, the Kenny? Do you remember the Kenny Rogers song "Coward of the County"? Sometimes you got to fight when you're a man. Yeah, you remember I that? Do. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh and, dear. <laughs> and you guys are all like a year apart, basically, eighteen months apart, all five. Right. Boys yeah. Oh, there was lots of physical altercations <laughs> yeah. within our house, yeah. but outside of our house, like as well, you know. And um, so it just that was it. Like we we did. We had so much fun growing up in the orange groves, and um, you know, having fun with. Mostly, like, there were a lot of LDS families that lived, like, right around us. And so up and down our street, like, um, you know, we we had all the people that we could ever want to hang out with and have fun with. And so, you know, we really got that situation where we lived outdoors and you come home when, like, the street lights come on kind of a thought. And so that was that was idyllic. Like, and and then... Real quick, I think yeah. Margie has a question. Oh, uh, I was going to just ask, because um, I'm kind of hearing you talk about your dad, and as this gregarious, he feels kind of a, like a larger-than-life figure in many ways. Um, and then also you're talking a little bit with your parents, very role-identified, I'm kind of hearing you know that as well. And... Y- conflict style a little bit between siblings, I'm assuming, maybe not parents. I, I don't know how that works with the physical thing, but like <laughs> the, this kind of sibling conflict style, which I could see working for some personalities, maybe better suited to, like, I'm curious how, what you would talk about with, what was your experience of your mom as a boy, your experience of her and what was your experience with the fighting, the physical nature? Was that something you felt a lot of love for each other? And so within the fighting, it didn't feel particularly threatening. Was it hard? Was it something that you 
feared in your house seeing fighting? I'm just curious about experientially, your experience with your mom and your experience now with this kind of way that conflict was dealt with um, in your family culture. Huh. That's that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so, I mean, my mom was definitely, like, passive. And, but, like, I think that her style was kind of, she was okay with us working it out physically with each other. Like, she didn't, I mean, I don't know, like, if we got in fights and stuff, like, she wasn't, like, that wasn't, like, really a big deal. Um, I, I can't remember any punishment around that particularly. And I think a lot of times, like, it was worked out and not brought to mom, right? Like, so if my brother beat me up or if I beat up one of my little brothers, like... Um, she never heard about it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think so. I don't, I, I don't really think that that was... That never really escalated. Um I, I think that my dad definitely um, got the fallout when it would happen, like at church or at school or whatever. She, I think there was definitely like that, hey, Scott, this is because of you, you know, kind of a, a, a thing. But I, I, I don't think that that was that big a deal. Honestly, like I think for my mom, dealing with so many young boys, like – she was just trying to survive. Like she was just trying to make sure that our worlds continued to function and that she was able to take care of herself as much as possible emotionally. Like I, I don't, I don't recall much around that as far as expectation or punishment. I will say though, that I was the third of, I was the third of our six children. And so now, like stepping back and looking at my role um, in the family, like I definitely feel like I fit that middle child um, personality really well. Like um, the connector and the one that wants everybody to be happy, um, making sure that I'm not like offending uh, people and like carrying their emotions, like when they're upset at me or whatever, or I don't want them to be upset at each other, that kind of thing. And, and like, ultimately I feel like that served me well in many ways throughout the rest of my life, but I can definitely see, see my role in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so R Prayer and scripture study and church attendance and like word of wisdom and law of chastity, were those all Sabbath observance? Were those all really important parts of your Mormon upbringing? Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess this is a Mormon orthodoxy test. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, look, I say, and I think just like probably most Mormon families uh, at the time that were active, like a family home evening was like hammered down, right? Like, but I would say, like, we were, like, a three-quarters of the time uh, family when it came to that. Family was the focus, no question. I remember, like, my parents' temple attendance was pretty high. Um, word of wisdom, absolutely. I remember um, it was controversial when my dad would have a caffeine-free diet Pepsi <laughs> in the house, right? Like it was, was that like evil or was it, you know, I mean, cause you're still kind of like supporting the brand that, you know, that has the caffeine in it, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, honestly, like the, even the caffeine issue, like, I don't, I don't even think that I ever saw my dad drink a caffeinated drink until probably 10 years into after my mission. We're like, talking Diet Coke or... Like, I'm, yeah, Coke. like now it's fine, whatever. Like it's pretty widely accepted, but it was a big deal mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and, you know, law of chastity, like, I mean, that's definitely like going to be something that, that we talk about. But like in the 90s, especially, I, I mean, I, I, I believe that this was like the whole church. And from a perspective of like what we heard at general conference and whatnot, I would definitely say that it was, but like the talk around, uh, pornography was 
uh, ever present. Like I, all the state conferences. Um, and so with five boys, like, are you kidding me? Like mm -hmm. that we had that conversation. There was so much fear around it. Like, what was the message convey what the me messages were you were receiving? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, <laughs> I've heard something throughout my whole life and I, I didn't, I really kind of almost, I've heard it a lot in the last couple of years where people are starting to talk about this, but you know, uh, sexual sin, uh, is, it's the second most serious thing uh, that you can do uh, behind murder, right? And so, like, it's like adultery or other kinds of fornication. And then, like, right under that, like, just one smidge under is the thoughts that you think and the, the material that you consume, right? So it's like, like murder, adultery... <laughs> And then, like, right under those two horrendous things is, like, having bad thoughts and... Or porn, or, yeah. Or porn or masturbation. Oh, yeah, or, like, <laughs> um, you know, like, and, okay, this is, like, way too much information, but that's fine. <laughs> I'm here. Whatever. Um, but, like, JCPenney's catalog, right? Like, if there's underwear mm. models in there, like, whoa. Like, yeah. And so, like, it, it, was, it was a point... If like that kind of stuff were around, like to throw it away, to hide it, like Victoria's Secret catalog ever came um, in the mail, like, like, poof. yeah, you got to get that. That's like Satan's like playground right there, you know. And so like that, <laughs> that was definitely the messaging and modesty from like the perspective of, um. You know, I, this is such a weird thing to say, and and I'm I don't know where it comes from, but like, um, you know, I was ten when we had uh, my my parents had my youngest sister, and like we couldn't change her diaper, right? Like that's weird, right? Uh -huh. And so now I'm not saying. That that's I'm not pointing anything at my parents and saying, hey, they're weird. No, like they I'm sure somebody said something, they got messaging somehow, like whatever. They're they're good people trying to do their thing. Mm -hmm. But now that I look about look at it, I'm like, Yeah, it's it's fine. Like you you can help change kids babies' diapers. They're just babies. Boy babies, girl babies, they're babies. It's fine. You know? And so, but like that the messaging around like that kind of stuff and like we you'd have these like joint um uh what do you call it like uh firesides or whatever and they talk about modesty or like the third hour where they would be combined and the messaging around like yeah if these girls are wearing things that like are too low cut or too high cut or whatever like that's temptation for you and like yeah so that messaging was like oh you guys are like these sexual beings that aren't going to be able to control your thoughts so mm -hmm. we have to control everything for you right like it's very important that you don't have you can't be left to your carnal desires right um and so you know that that was definitely the messaging um, that I received. You almost didn't go on a second date with me because you thought I was wearing a tank top. Maybe that's why I <laughs> did go on a second <laughs> date with you. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I definitely remember noticing on our first date. It wasn't actually a tank top. It was cap sleeve <laughs> something. I don't know. But yeah, so, but at the end of the day, like. You get the point? You get yeah. the picture? Oh my goodness. <laughs> but truly, like, that that was the messaging. And so yeah. around that, um, there, yeah, there was a lot. Um, mm. uh, so much. Like, all the time. Every large meeting that we had. And then so many um messages on that in priesthood and in, you know, other, other, um, you know, kind of bishop youth discussion or firesides at that time, right? Like firesides and yeah. And so that was, 
that's what it was around that. Yeah. I'm curious, do you, when you're talking about this, do you remember kind of the age that uh, that pornography or this danger, this intensity around conversations with regard to your thoughts and, um, you know, modesty and all those things. Do you remember how old you were about when it kind of entered your consciousness? And do you remember, was it the church that initially brought it to you? Yeah. Um, I would say that... I mean, the first time that I recall coming into contact with pornography at all um, was I was probably 10 years old. I was nine when we moved to the area where we were like right next to the orange groves. And some dude at some point um, had stashed like a porn stash out in the orange groves, you know? And so that's where I came in contact with that. Um, And I remember... Like did, being, you, did you have an orange grove as part of your property or did you So we probably by? had like 30 orange trees or something like that. But We live on an orange yard. grove now, actually. Wow. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> Down <the street>. directly <laughs> next door to us, like we had a fence that led into probably 40 acres of orange oh, grove. Wow. And so we, we ran around that a lot. And um, so anyways, like... We, we had a lot of fun and time there, and there was a little creek that ran next to our house, and we would, like, we had this tire swing that we would swing over the creek, and I don't know, it was, oh. it was fun. That is idyllic. Yeah, part. yeah. Yeah. But well, about um, 20 yards from that uh, tire swing is where this guy would uh, hide his porn. And so... Like a Playboy or... Yeah, I mean, uh, probably a little bit more aggressive than Playboy. Okay. Um, but, I mean, still, like... it. That was intriguing to me. I was like, oh, this is interesting stuff. Like, um, and so, I mean. And you said you're 10 at this point. Yeah, like 10, somewhere in that. So if it's like a like penthouse, if it's like a. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah, something like that. So it's more graphic yeah, a magazine more. porn, basically. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. And you have exper- an experience, it sounds like, where you're curious. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Curious and, and so... And Ten's kind of young to hit a penthouse magazine. I, you yeah, know, I, th- I think for so. For me, I, yeah. 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 This is all pre-internet, so... Yeah, I mean, this was like 90, um, 91, 92. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that that age mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. kind of range. And so, I mean, I'm sure that the internet was there, but it's like... Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. like... More effort. Kind of internet, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's like something's loading, you know, like it's slowly loading on the page. Yeah, no. Um, but, and we didn't, at that time, we didn't have internet in the house, even if it was available. Um, but yeah, so there was that. So I remember that. And then I was, I was very interested in girls. Like at that time I was, um, and so there was like lots of just, I think the messaging when it became super prevalent for me, besides in my own home of like, you know, not we don't watch this on TV because this is inappropriate and like that kind of stuff. (laughs) um, Really, it's when I became 12, right? Like once I hit priesthood. That, Mm -hmm. like, I I knew that porn was like a no-no taboo kind of thing. And I would say, like, seeing that magazine and probably definitely there were times over the next few years that I stumbled across that. But that was basically my, like, only access to it. And that was infrequent at best, you know, Mm -hmm. probably when this guy's wife caught him or something (laughs) like that or whatnot. And he had to stash in the orange groves, you know. I mean, I don't know. Who does that? That's, (laughs) you know. So anyways, um, but um yeah once i turned 12 like that's when the the flame turned up the heat was on and and so that would have been like 94 like right in that range uh is when yeah i mean we i just started hearing about it all the time and so i knew that i had already seen porn and so like that wasn't good right like that was really bad and 
Um, so, so you're like, tainted. You're already tainted from a Mormon Christian yeah, I point mean, of view. I think so. Um, and so that was that was also um, that was also a time at around eleven. I started gaining weight as well. Um, and so, like, I at that time, I would say that that's really kind of like when my major shame and guilt um, mm. started and like self deprecation and whatnot, like that kind of a thought process really, that's really when it majorly started for me is I, I'm, I'm gaining weight. I'm a little bit of a chubby kid now. And, um, also I'm feeling bad about myself because I, I couldn't have believed more in the church, right? Like that, it was my life. Like it was, you know, we'd wake up at that time. We'd wake up at like uh, 7 a.m. or something like every morning, 6.30 or something, and study the scriptures as a family before um, my brothers would leave to school who um, were in high school or whatever. Like it was it was super early, like, but the focus was strong um, on all of that. And so it was the most important thing. And so then you tell me like, Hey, this is such a big sin and this is such a big problem. And, you know, like, and I've had some experience with that. And so, and at that time, like, like you said, there wasn't internet, so it wasn't like super frequent, but I felt bad, you know, like I felt like I'm not hitting that mark. Like I am not, um, what I should be. Mm. And yeah. Um, you know, and I wanted to be, I wanted to be, um, who God wanted me to be. Like that was so, so important to me. Um, and I felt that so deeply and, you know, yeah, like, so that, that kind of time I've been coming aware that, Hey, like, like I'm a chubby kid now. I, I hadn't been to that point in my life and, like I had that kind of weird thought process. So on the exterior, I'm not like what I want to be or what other people want me to be. And then also on the inside, like I know that I'm not what I'm supposed to be. And so then like as I keep hearing this messaging like all the time um, around that, like that, that was really impactful for me. And I definitely informed my teenage years in the way that I dealt with, um, I, I feel like I dealt with some scrupulosity, um, to do with that, like hyper focus on that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like if I ever had like an experience or a bad thought, like I felt like I needed to unburden myself to God, to my bishop, um, you know, whoever my priesthood leader is. And, you know, my dad was, um, pretty fastidious. Like, I mean, he, uh, he held PPIs, right? Like the personal priesthood interviews, we had them. Tell, tell a oh. never Mormon <laughs> yeah. what a PPI is and what it, what it would be like. Yeah. So a personal priesthood interview with my dad was like, Hey, you know, um, it, it is his obligation as the priesthood holder, the patriarch of the home, to make sure that his kids are headed on the straight and narrow, right? Like that we are doing the right things, that we're getting uh, the right messaging, and that we're going to ultimately progress in the church and um, towards God. And so his role in that was having these monthly check-ins with us and asking us about how our scripture study was going asking us about our prayers, asking us if we had any questions, asking us um, if we were having any struggles. So those that personal priesthood interview really was focusing on my worthiness, mm -hmm. like on my relationship with God, on how it is that I could better that, how it is that I could uh, live up to what those expectations were. And uh, like... I, I so wanted to be like everything that the church wanted me to be. Like, that's what I wanted because I felt like, um, by, 
by being that, that I was manifesting to God that I loved God, that I was a good person. And, and truly, like, the messaging was that if you check these boxes, if you do these things, then you will be happy. Hmm. And so often I wasn't. Like, I wasn't hitting the mark, like, on my physicality. I wasn't hitting the mark um, on my morality. I wasn't, you know, hitting the mark um, in the places that I wanted to be. And so, like, that was important to me. And so that's what I wanted. I wanted to be happy. I wanted to find that happiness within the the structure that had been given to me. And so I would participate in these PPIs. And one thing that I think most people that surround me even today would say is like, I'm an open book. Like, so if you're my priesthood leader and you're asking me a question, um, lots of people have like great boundaries. Um, I'm not one of those people. Like, and I'm, I'm definitely doing better on that today than I have uh, earlier in my life, but I felt like honesty meant kind of like what I feel like the narrative of the church was, is like um, hiding anything, like telling partial truths is a lie, right? And so like, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that I was being as transparent as possible. So like God could work through me as i as I performed and like I did the things that I was supposed to do, no matter how shameful that was, like I accepted that shame was a part of my existence. Like mm. you show up um, and you take the shame, you take the pain because ultimately like that was going to be the thing um, that could help you to progress. Right. Cause that's how like we weren't, going to attain perfection in this life, but we could come pretty close to it if like we went through and we were completely vulnerable and completely accepting of our our faults and our weaknesses. And by by not lying at all and being completely transparent, like, and so- It's I, almost like purification or sanctification through shame. Oh, well, for sure. Like- hundred percent for me. Like that's what it was. And honestly, um, looking back at it, like, I feel like the narrative was that the more shame that you were willing to endure, the better of a person that you could become and, and, or you were right. And so uh, I could not be perfect. Like I couldn't meet the marks, but I could be perfect and be willing to throw myself under the bus. Like I could be perfect and in being vulnerable and being transparent. And, and so like now looking at that, I'm like, Whoa, that that's a big problem. Like lots of issues surrounding that in relation to the way that I related with people in the relation that I would way that I related to my priesthood leaders, to my parents, to all of those things, like, but boundaries did not exist when it came to that stuff. Like my, my dad, my mom, not, not so much my mom, but my dad, if he asked me anything, my bishop, he asked me anything, like you tell it, all of it. Mm. And can I ask about that? So um, you've talked about pornography, but what what's kind of a twin topic of discussion with in the Mormon experience, especially adolescent Mormon experiences, masturbation. Right. I don't bring that up to be graphic or to be nosy, um, but because they're kind of interwoven. It's not just, oh, you looked at some images. It's what you do after or while you're looking at the images that then becomes a real problem and that really in Mormonism contributes to the shame cycle which then contributes to the need for a savior and for an atonement and the need to confess yeah. to Bishop or dad, or sometimes your Bishop is your dad, but that's the only way you get cured or healed is through the atonement of Jesus and through confession. And that's repentance. Right. So do you, do you want to talk about whether that was a masturbation was a component of your shame cycles? Yeah, for sure. I mean, to me, um, like 
those things went together like that. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's everybody's experience. I assume that it is. Um, but definitely it was, I, I, I had some interesting messaging around that, especially in my later teenage years. Um, and you know, where I, I had like, I had a bishop, like tell me he's like well like part of the problem here is like um biologically like you don't know how many kids you're going to be able to have and it's like and if you do too much of that like you may um not be able to have as many kids as you want to have or as the lord expects you to have like if you uh continue to uh spill your seed like i mean hmm. it's such a now I look at that, I'm like, but I, <laughs> so that, that was a weird one. Now mm -hmm. looking back at it at the time, I was like, oh yeah, for sure. I don't want to <laughs> prohibit myself from being able to have the kids that I, God wants me to have. It's like you've got 12 spurs. <laughs> so <laughs> scarcity. It's like scarcity <laughs> mindset for your, <laughs> yeah, for for your sure. swimmers. Was for, the little factory talk a thing when you were growing up? Uh, I, before your age, probably. I didn't hear about the little factory I'm sure that that bishop had heard about the little factory, <laughs> right? But um, I, we'll, put, we'll put it. We'll put in the show notes Boyd K. Packer's <laughs> little factory talk, just because it's worth looking into. I, I didn't hear about that talk until my mission. Okay, that was the first time that I heard about that. But yeah, so yes, those things went hand in hand. And then I would also say, like, um, you know, at that time, I I had. Through my youth, I, I can't remember how many bishops I had, but quite a few. But, I mean, there would be bishops that would ask, like, details, like what kind of stuff that you look at, like, and, like, descriptive stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Now that I look at it, you know, and especially looking at, like, you know, Sam Young and, like, his mission, um, you know, I look at so much of that stuff and I'm like, gosh, dang it. Like that is, that's problematic. Like and for, you, and for our viewers and listeners who are newer and don't know about Sam Young, you're talking about the issue of Mormon bishops sitting alone with a 12 or 13 year old girl or boy in a room, asking them intimate questions about their sexuality in a way that maybe in any other context would be viewed as predatory. Is that what you mean? Hundred percent. Okay. Like, like you. I mean, I, I was taught that you tell everything to your bishop. Like you leave no stone unturned. Like you, you let them know what's going on in your head, every innermost thought and feeling. And so, if you ask me, like, what kind of pornography I like to look at, like, I would tell you. And so you're having I, this conversation with your bishop uh, behind closed doors as a twelve times. or a thirteen year old. Yeah, multiple times. Yeah, um, multiple bishops. He's like, "What? What type of porn are you into?" Young man? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it's. I don't remember the specifics. I remember sharing specifics. Like, I don't remember their questions. I remember what I shared, and so, uh, down to like, it went in my older years, like websites and things like that. You know, like, and so, it's friggin' weird. Like, that's, anyways. Uh, I could, I would never, I would never think to like ask that to some kid. Like that's, that's so odd <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and very inappropriate. But now I look at that as a grown man and I'm like, you know, there's a lot of perversion that I think surrounds that stuff too. And I, I'm not saying that any of the bishops specifically were like, using that inappropriately. They may have been told the questions that they had to ask. I'm going to assume everybody's a good guy, um, like, uh, slash. Just doing what they're told to do. Doing what they're told to do. But at the same time, like, uh, it it was highly inappropriate and weird and abusive and really took a lot of boundaries away, f helped me understand that there weren't boundaries and, like, Anyways, it was it's just kind of a weird experience. And so around around that, like I would definitely say that um 
those things went hand in hand and that that was asked about. But uh, the, the focus definitely was more around pornography than masturbation, like at least in, um, in that time, you know, of my life. Okay. Yeah. I'm curious, how did all of this uh, frame your sense of your sexual self during that time? I mean, I, I truly thought I was a deviant. Like, I truly thought that, like, I, there was something wrong with me that I was so attracted um, to, you know, porn or masturbation or whatever. Like, I, I thought that that was, like, a really, you know, and they talk about the carnal man and stuff like that. And I would hear, like, at school... Um, like Mormon scripture says, a, the natural man is an enemy to God. Right. Yes. An enemy. Like that's some pretty severe language. Right? For sure. And I and I would. That's what I was. Definitely. Like mm. enemy to God. So you're like a 14, 15, Seriously. 16 year old kid feeling like God's enemy. Yeah. I mean, I did, and I. Mm-hmm. So, I I would hear things at school like the percentage of people that look at pornography and stuff. And that was all fine because from that perspective, I was like, oh, yeah, well, normal guys do that. But I wasn't normal, yeah. right? Like I was a priesthood holder. Like mm-hmm. I was. Where much, you know, where much is given, much is required. Yeah, for sure. Retired, and right? like I, I knew all the things, the special things that nobody else knew. I was a part of this like special group. And God's expectation from me was like super high um, and I just, for some reason, I couldn't meet it. Like, I, I don't, I didn't know why I was so broken. Like, why I couldn't just not be interested in that stuff. Like, I, I couldn't consider that sexuality was, like, a normal thing. Like, I couldn't, cons- because that wasn't. Like, it was not messaged to me that that was a normal human function. Like, that, yeah. that and so. Developmentally very appropriate what you're experiencing as opposed to right and I could hear it out in the world as much as possible and it didn't matter I because I couldn't download that right yeah like that file wasn't accepted that format just that's not how it worked and so it's like oh yeah for them for like all the heathens right like Mm -hmm. that's okay like but because they don't know better right like they don't know what God expects from them And, and honestly I would say at that time in my life specifically like there was some sort of jealousy surrounding that that my friends weren't burdened with all the knowledge, yeah. the special knowledge that I had. Like and like they can just live their normal lives and they can go out and have fun, right? And they can go out and um, not not have to carry the shame and guilt that I did um, because they didn't know as much. And so while it was it was you know like sad for them. Right, that they didn't have that because there were so many blessings that come from the church. Like, if you would have asked me what the blessings were, I could have named them off. I couldn't tell you how I felt in my life. I could just tell you that they were good, right? And so they didn't have those things, and so they didn't have that accountability. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, it would be kind of cool not to have that accountability, but I do, and so I'm stuck with it, and this is my burden, and God is disappointed in me because he's given me all this stuff. Mm. And so, like, that's where I was. I'm guessing there's a mountain of listeners, men mm-hmm. and women and everyone else, who are uh, relating to what yeah. you're saying right now. Yeah. So I'm curious if this is the right time or not to introduce the abuse that you experienced Yeah. timeline-wise. Yeah, so... Or if there's other things you wanted to talk no, about. No, I mean, I, th- I think it ties in to this um, pretty well. Okay. Because when I was seven, um, we had a babysitter who was in the ward, um, a priest at that time, that um, abused myself and one of my siblings. Um, And, you know, I I still... um, I still vividly remember 
um, something that happened when I was seven years old, which there's not many memories that I carry with me uh, from being seven year old, but I remember what the couch looked like. I remember where it was located. I remember, you know, what room I was in. I remember where I was sitting. I remember where he was sitting. Um, I remember where my sibling was sitting. Um, like when this, this was going on and do you want to share whether this was a member of the church? Yeah, he was a priest, um, in the church. So he was like 16, 17, something like that. Okay. Um, at, at that time, I don't, I don't know. Like I know his name. I know, uh, like yeah. I know that kind of stuff. But I don't, um, I don't know exactly how many years older he is. Like so, these are approximations. But yeah. I know that I lived in my previous house, like before we had moved over to the Orange Grove property. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I remember that. And then, um. That was that was basically it. Like I remember that experience, and then as I'm in my teenage years, and I'm struggling. Um, really quick, did you did you report it? Did you tell your parents? Did you think to tell your siblings? You, you know, um, as a, you're only seven, so. I, and and did you share it with a sibling? It sounds like a sibling was there. As yes, well. there there was a sibling. My older one of my older siblings that was um, also a victim. Yeah. Um, of this. And I, I've talked to him in the last couple of years about it after like this stuff has gone on with, with our family, uh, like with our child being an abuse victim. And so like, as we're kind of talking through it and how it all played out, he has a little bit more memory than I do as to how the aftermath played out. Mm-hmm. Um, and his, um, his recollection um, surrounding that was that he did tell my parents right away. Um, and that they, that they're like, no, like that couldn't have happened. You must have misunderstood or whatever. And so that was, um, that's what he remembers from the situation. Um, Mm. and then what, my first recollection of like dealing with the issue was as a teenager. Um, and I'm going through all this shame and guilt and I'm looking for reasons, right? Like, why am I broken? Hmm. And I remember talking to my dad, I was probably 15 years old at the time. And I brought up this, um, this abuser and I I asked him like, I was like, do you remember that? And he's like, yeah, I do. He's like, and I thought at that time that it would be helpful to me. Like I felt like maybe this was the reason that I was broken. Um, and I remember thinking like, Hey, if I could talk to this guy and he knew like how much this hurt, hurt me, and like the implications that it had on my life, that that would be like cathartic to me. Um, and so my dad did agree, like, and we got his number and I called and talked to him. Um, he would have been an adult by then. Oh, you know, he was. Well, didn't he tell your dad about it right before his mission? Well, and so, yeah, so I, yeah, he did. And so my dad did tell me that prior to me calling and talk to him. And so, well, so I, I'm sorry, just if you're able to share, yeah. would he have experienced any consequences or punishment in the ward uh, as a result of the, it being known that he had done that to you and your brother? Yeah. N- um, I mean, consequences. In theory, I guess. In, yeah. In, in theory, right? Like, <laughs> did he, so, was he reported the police? No, 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 no. No, he went on a mission. Right. And so, was he, yeah, was he excommunicated? No. So what? Uh, I don't know. Were members of the ward even warned that he was out there? No. And, absolutely and not. And had abused two children? No. Like what happened from my dad's, um, you know, story to me on that was that um, a week or so before this kid left on a mission, um, he approached my dad in the hall at church 
and told him what had happened mm. as a part of his like last penance or whatnot, like to confessional, um, you know, to be able to go on his mission. And so like his bishop told him that he needed to go tell my dad. So he did. Um, and then my dad, you know, it, the, the complicated thing that I have found with sexual abuse is like in confessional or whatever, like the way that that story gets related to the victim or the victim's parents or whatever, yeah, directly informs what kind of response that they're going to get. And like they can diminish the abuse as much as they want. Like, so who knows what he told my dad? Well, and but, also if your dad did anything and this kid didn't go on a mission, it would have been because of you guys. And that would have been a big thing. Well, and and at the time, like, I mean, I if you don't have any experience with this thing, I mean, I know my dad had been a bishop at that point, or maybe, 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 yeah, he had been a bishop at that point. And like, you know, the bishop receives revelation for the ward. And like, that's direct from the Lord for these people. So like, if the Lord was okay with this kid going on a mission still, whatever abuse was done to me, obviously wasn't like, it wasn't that important. Like it wasn't that, that big a deal. Wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. Like, and so like that is, that's the story in, in my, that he, I feel like he would have been receiving. And I am not speaking to like, I, I don't know. I can't pretend to know my dad's life experience, what was going on in his head, what was going on in his heart. Like, um, I, I don't know those things, but I do know that at least from what he expressed to me at that point, as I'm 14 or 15 years old, talking to him about why I'm broken and, you know, and he's recalling to me what happened. Like, he's like, you know, he was about to leave on a mission. Like, what was I going to do? Like, what was there for me to do? Like, that was his response to me as a 15-year-old. And more recently, over the last couple of years, as we've talked about it, I think that, um, you know, I think that he would have done things differently given the experience that he's had now in life and his experience now in the church. Um, he would have demanded different things. He would have pushed for, you know, for other stuff and disclosure and all these things. But at the time, I don't think that, I don't think that calling the police was even like. Wasn't even a thought. Yeah, I don't think that was a thought. And definitely surrounding the church, it was not a thought. Like, I mean, even even still the church today, that's not what you do. You call a helpline. That's, that's a whole different thing. But at the time, um, the, all that had happened was that he went and told his bishop. His bishop's like, okay, probably, I don't know what happened, but probably to stop taking the sacrament for a few weeks or a couple months or something like that. And then you just keep working hard to get on your mission, right? And now I look at that as an adult. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're going to send a guy out on a mission that definitely has like... And people have missionaries in their house with their kids and stuff. Yeah, that can play with them, sit on their laps, like whatever. Yeah, yeah I, I want to ask a bunch of questions, but Margie wants to Yeah, I have two questions okay. around that. The, the first question is, so um, did your dad ever ask you about what happened? So he got the version from, right, the young man before he's trying to get out on a mission. Did you get asked? No. No, I didn't. Do you, are you comfortable sharing what's coming up for you right now when Margie Yeah, yeah. You anything that you, anything you want to ask. I'm good. What? What's coming up for you right now? One more. No, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I, I, until you asked me that, I hadn't even thought about it that way. Like, but yeah, I mean, no, I wasn't asked. I wasn't asked like what happened? What do you remember? Now I, I will say like this was impactful to me and I remember the incident, 
Um, I do believe that if it was made a big deal that I would remember. It is possible that I don't remember and he did ask me, but I don't remember that. And I feel like that would have been a part of this story for me that I would remember. Mm -hmm. And so 40-year-old Jared remembering seven-year-old Jared's thoughts is maybe, you know, hard, but I do not remember being asked. And my brother, um, who is 18 months old, older than me, all he remembers uh, is the denial around the fact that, like, that that would have been the case, right? Like, and so, no, like, it wasn't, it wasn't asked to me that I, I can recall, like, what happened, what do you remember, like, and I, I think, obviously, that that is a very important question to have asked. Yeah. And then I was just going to ask you, do you remember how you felt when you were talking with your dad um, about uh, the young man approaching him in the hall and sharing what happened and how your dad explained? I think you said something to the effect of like, well, what was I supposed to say? Or do you remember how it felt for you to hear about the young man trying to go on a mission and this second sort of touch point around what happened to you. Do you remember how you felt when you were hearing your dad talk about it? I mean, at that time, I'm positive that I would have been like, well, you know, God forgave him. So like, obviously he needs to go on a mission what, what, op- I mean, I really kind of at that time would have given every latitude, you know, um, to the church, to my dad, like, because it wasn't, and to be honest, like one of the reasons that this was shameful to me is because at the time, also the messaging around homosexuality, well, I mean, still today in the church is so, uh, so bad. And so I, this happened with a man. Like, so where did that put me? Like, so there was so much confusion and angst about even bringing that up. Cause like, I, so I don't, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know how else to explain that, but, um, over the last couple of years is I've revisited this. Um, like it's, it has brought me pain. Um, the way that this was not handled, you know, like the way that mm-hmm. there was not punishment, there was not accountability. And I, I'm not saying that from that Bishop's perspective that there wasn't, or from the church's perspective, like, I think that's literally how they dealt with it. Like that's, it's like, Oh Yeah. You don't do that. Boys will be boys, but don't do that anymore. You know, be good. Um, like, uh, and so I think that that it, that time especially was severely dim- diminished. And I think in our experience, that's still very often the case. Um, and so I wouldn't say that I necessarily felt betrayed at the time. I definitely felt betrayed um, over the last few years as I've revisited this. And seen it in your own family with yeah. your own kid. Yeah. M- maybe if I can, I'm just trying to make sense of this. Do you mind if I just try and process this a tiny bit? First yeah. of all, thank you for sharing something so vulnerable. Mm-hmm. I just want to stop and take note that this is very, um, yeah. very powerful and important that you're willing to talk about this. And thank you. Um, so there's three perspectives that I'm that are coming to my mind, and I'm going to end with with the victims because I think they're it's pretty clear that within Mormonism, their perspective is considered last. Mm-hmm. Right. From the church's perspective, that that's the first perspective. It seems like, we'll say in your case, the church wants, the church has all the power, first of all. The church is the broker and the arbiter of everything, including whether or not the police is contacted, you know, mm-hmm. whether or not there's discipline for the, the young kid, you know, whether or not it, they inform the ward and warn members to protect other potential, you know, victims and all that. And it seems like from the church's perspective, 
they have an interest, you know, and they don't want lawsuits, right? They don't want to be sued. They don't want accountability. Yeah. They don't want their reputation being damaged, uh, either in the ward or in the stake or, or heaven forbid in the media or in the bigger community. So it seems like the church with all the power has all the incentive to make this be quiet, to make this go away, to not really let it get out, to keep it under wraps. And that means punishing the boy as little as possible, because if the boy doesn't go on a mission, everybody knows. And that's, that's how the cat gets out of the bag. So the church downplays it with you, downplays it with your dad, wants to sweep it under the rug, gives minimal punishment to the boy, to the, to the, to the perpetrator, to the abuser, and tries to act like the atonement is going to make all this right. And, and conveniently that also protects the church. So that's how I'm, that's how I'm processing the church's point of view mm -hmm. um, on this. Margie, you're nodding. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the next, and of course it's sad that we're going to your point of view last, but I, again, that's how the church. Well, it's I not think, just boys, I guess. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Okay. So then going to the, the church's, the, the perspective around the abuser, I imagine that the church is trying to be compassionate and saying, look, we sin, this kid sinned, but we don't want to ruin his life. You know, kids, like you said, boys will be boys, girls will be girls, kids make mistakes. If he's, if it's publicly known that he's a pedophile, right, he's going to be ruined. If, if we go to the police, this kid's going to be ruined. He'll have a record. He'll never be able to get a job. He'll be shamed. It'll destroy this abuser's life. So for the benefit of the abuser, we're going to keep it internally. We're going to keep it quiet. We're going to not let members of the ward or stake or let alone the police or the community know. And he'll repent. Jesus and the atonement are all powerful. And so we'll get him on the repentance process. He'll be extra motivated to be a good boy because we, he knows we've got this on him. And we'll get him on a mission. We'll get him repented, and he'll be cleaned and purified by the blood of Christ. And he'll go on to lead to be a great priesthood holder, maybe even be a bishop someday, but certainly serve a mission, get married in the temple, and be on plan. And that's certainly best, the best way to handle it for the abuser um, from the church's and from the gospel's perspective. That's how I'm guessing the church sees it. Does that sound right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, and I, you know, I've done some research over the last um, year and a bit um, on this uh, abuser. And I mean, that's the way it's played out for him. Like He works with children now? Yeah. Yeah. He what? In his professional book career. I mean, he, he's a psychologist, I believe. Mm. Um, he works, he works for the government in some way, shape or form mm. out in DC. Mm. Um, and, but I mean, I know that he's got multiple children, he's active. Um, mm. and like at least that part of it from an outward perspective has played out well for him. I don't know. Um, you know, like I look at that and like, I, I don't know what happened on his mission. I don't know what other experiences he's had since then. And maybe this was the only experience that he ever had in his life. Um, in general, I think that that's probably very rarely the case. Right. Um, but the, the things that I know about sexual abusers today tell me that that's, that's not usually the case. I, I don't, you know, I don't need to, um, dive into that necessarily with this guy more, but I, I, at the same time, like from the church's perspective, what they wanted to accomplish, it worked. Yeah. Yeah. Because pedophiles or child abusers often repeat right. and it, it's tough to kind of cure that. So maybe the odds are that he would have gone on to repeat offend, but it's also possible it was a one-off and just a, <laughs> just a weird curiosity or mistake that he made. And we don't know, Yeah, but the church certainly came down on the side of protecting the abuser yes. in full, in full force. A hundred percent. Which then 
I'm going to talk about two more dimensions now. One is the victim, because what I'm hearing from you is you're wallowing in this deep shame for very normal adolescent um, thoughts and feelings and behaviors around yep. sexual thoughts and masturbation. So you're tormenting yourself about how awful of a person you are, questioning your own worthiness, while someone who's behaving in actually horrific ways mm -hmm. is, is experiencing extreme leniency mm -hmm. and kind of gets off scot-free. I can't imagine what that's like for a victim. Yeah, it's, it's not good. There's I no mean, justice. There's no, no, nothing's done to protect you. And, well, you know. Ultimately, like what it, <laughs> what, what I've learned over a while now is that it confuses reality. Yeah. Right? Like when we make these things out to be such a big deal, like the, the pornography is just, it's about the worst thing that you can do. And like, you know, if you're an adult and you view it like you've cheated on your wife, like it's that big a deal. Like that's the thought around it. And then like, oh, well, yeah, if you if you touch people unconsensually, like if you do that kind of stuff, like that's that's more normal. Like that's kind of like, yeah, it's bad. You shouldn't do that, but it's OK. Like you can get through it pretty quickly. The punishment like um, I received punishments for similar things or like. I received harsher punishments for pornography than than what I believe this guy received for actual molestation. Right. So the church is going to punish a kid for for sexual thoughts, for healthy, normal, normative right. sexual thoughts and masturbation. The Mormon church is going to publish a kid more. Pu sorry, the Mormon church is going to punish a kid for normal and healthy sexual thoughts and behaviors, they're going to punish that Mormon kid more than an actual child abuser and pedophile. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's the messaging that I was receiving. I didn't like understand all of that until much later, but yes, like that was what was playing out for me as a teenager in my life. And, and so like, I, I feel like now I look back and I'm like, I can now absolutely see like how I took all of this stuff so seriously. Like besides the fact that I'm seeing it at conference all the time and all all of that stuff, but like I knew I knew that this guy um, had done that. And so when I go and talk to my dad as a teenager and say, "Hey, I think it's going to be helpful to me to talk to him on the phone and like just tell him how this has been a hard thing and I've struggled with this." And my dad agrees, and I get on the phone with him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, he didn't deny anything. Like, he was like, yeah, I, I did do that, and, I, and I'm so sorry it's caused you pain. Um, and so he did validate its reality to me. Um, and, I, you know, I didn't necessarily know what I thought I would get out of that, but I know what I did get out of it. And that was just, it was just knowing that I wasn't crazy, that this wasn't made up yeah. and that it was a real thing. Um, what I didn't get out of it was any sort of catharsis. Like I didn't, it was not a healing thing for me. Like I didn't feel any less screwed up. Like I still felt like, a piece of trash, like, um, and, you know, I, I have learned over time that, you know, everybody doesn't deal with things in the same way. Like I, I can tell you that, Hey, if you do this, you're a piece of crap. And like, you can say like, Oh no, that, like you can say that, but that's not true. I'm not really, I'm not a piece of crap. And then you tell other people that, and they're really like, Oh, you were right. Like I must be a horrible person. Like I must be. And that's how it manifested to me. Like when the church told me how serious and how bad this thing was, like I fully accepted that. I fully accepted 
that if you have these thoughts and these feelings and you do these things, that you are what they are saying you are. And so for me, like, that's the way that I received. And I think that a lot of my friends had similar experiences, but at the same time, um, others didn't. And so like, as I'm going through this process and like figuring out like, yeah, what kind of punishment he received, but what kind of punishments that I'm being given. And so then too, like how serious it is based off of the fact that Bishop, the guy that's talking to God for me in, in my understanding of the context of what his role was, um, like, yeah, you are, you're, you're broken. You need to be fixed. And there's something like majorly wrong with you because you keep coming back to this, right? Like you, you keep having these normal. Now I look at it, these normal functions of, uh, sexual expression, like, but at the time it's like, your carnal man just keeps kicking in and you just can't get over it. Like what, what's wrong? Like, why are you broken? Mm. And so, mm. yeah. I, I just wanted to, um, I'm observing in myself a loss here around, you know, you were talking, John, about kind of the church system, right? And how the church system showed up and, and really failed in a big way um, in this situation. And I was thinking, you know, oftentimes what we'll have is the family system, right? Then, then it can default and you'll have, you know, parents start advocating, right? Parents will step in. And there's a loss here and a merging that happens in family systems to the church where the family system actually is merged with the church system. And so a child doesn't have that either. And that's a true loss here. It's like multiple system failures when it comes to advocating for, for victims. And also I was going to say, you know, so there's that. Cause, there's cause just you're saying a, a normal family that wants to protect their kids would just be outraged that their kid got abused and they would go to the police and they would yeah. report it in the, in the, the perpetrator would go to juvie or whatever yes. and the community would know and the kid would feel protected and the kid would feel like mostly that their parents have their back and that their parents don't accept stuff like this. And maybe the kid would get therapy and the kid would get support and be able to work through all this sexual dysfunction. Like that's how a family might normally behave, but because the family looks to the church first as the way to handle all this, then the family's will just gets subjugated to the church's interests, which is largely largely guided by Kurt McConkey, a law firm that's just trying to protect the church's money and its power and its reputation. Yeah, and it reminds me of kind of earlier when you were talking about your dad, that this idea of consecration, you give all and then some, mm. right? You're going to give everything. Mm. And, and, I mean, this is really... A, a sad way to like bring that, but it, it was true, wasn't it? And that's a loss. That is a loss for an abuse victim, a child that, that they lose the family too, because the family is merged now here with the church's will and with the church's mission. And they're thinking about all the commitments they've made and all of those things. And it's just, it is a deep, deep loss. And then I was thinking as that you consecration were, has a whole new meaning. That's right. At that mm -hmm. point. Kind of a, what a you're, darker, right? A darker meaning. Yeah. Do you want? Do you, let's pause. And Margie, don't forget where you were going. Do you want to react to that? Yeah, I mean, um, I know that my parents showed up the way that they could, but I do hundred percent believe um, that. In this circumstance, that yeah, that the church crippled them. That it took. I I think that if this happened by a football coach or a baseball coach or something like that, um, that they would have shown up completely differently. Um, I, I my dad is a physical guy. I he would have shown up in a completely different way. And like, I think that my, like if it were a baseball coach, he'd be in the hospital. Yeah. Like, he probably would overact in a good way, maybe, but 
if yeah. the perpetrator were a baseball Not coach, someone from the church community. Yeah. Then your dad would have been angry and 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 he would have gone, out. you know, my dad could have gone to jail too, but they, you know, at least both of them he would have set up for his family. But because so, it wasn't a baseball coach, it was uh, someone in the church, in the church family, so to speak. And and then had already been dealt with by a priest and leader. So he felt that, that everything was done. And so it, it was finished, you know. And I'm not, look, I'm not saying that my dad is not a guy that would push back um, against the church. He he would. He'd push back in the system, but in the system, right? Like, and so once you meet enough resistance and your priesthood leader has spoken, it's done. Yeah. Obedience, right? Yeah. 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 My second thought was just as you were talking about the shame you carried, the beliefs about yourself. Um, it just reminded me of this, this another loss that came from, uh, you know, this, the family system merging with the church system. Because I think what happens when children, you know, have experiences that they don't understand, like there's no way at seven you're trying to figure this out and make sense of what happened to you, is that you, a child just does the best they can and they form beliefs. Like you hear in divorce oftentimes that with children, maybe a child will blame themselves. They'll think they caused the. And what happens is, is if a child isn't actually talked to, communicated with, um, you lose the ability to kind of intervene in what beliefs get formed right. in those moments. And they live on and on and on. There's sometimes what I understand the stickiest narratives, the stickiest beliefs to kind of confront. And, and so that's the other loss here is just when a family is so, or parents are so merged with the church mission that they become the church functionally in the family is that that child is left alone, completely alone with the experience and their brain is going and they don't know what to make of it. So inevitably, oftentimes they, they make it about them, right? Which is what we see. And that, what do you mean they make it about them? About their, Who? like about the Who's victim. They? The victim is making narratives like, I must, there must be something wrong with me. I must have wanted it. Mm, well, okay. that felt good. So that must mean that I'm kind of depraved or I'm whatever the narrative is. I'm just saying. Or I'm not worthy. Or I'm not worthy. Yeah. Or something's wrong with me or, you, you know, whatever the narrative is, it's usually uh, really harming the victim more and stays with the victim, you know, for, and that's the other loss is just for a child we need adults that talk to children in these circumstances to be able to say, hey, hey, here's what this was about. And this wasn't about you. And tell me what is going on in your mind and let me hear it. And let me kind of also correct what your child brain is now telling you about this situation. Because oftentimes it's clearly just not true. And that is a total loss that I'm hearing you speak to as you're talking. And I just wanted to highlight it because I think it's really important. Thank you. Yeah. Does that resonate? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I, with our own children, um, being able to have some of those conversations and, uh, you know, when they're going through different struggles and, helping them to like put things into context and, uh, and frame them as it's a valuable part of parenting. Like, and so, yeah, I mean, I feel like in that scenario, um, my parents belief like definitely was crippling for that, for that thing. And I like one thing that I really want to drive home here. And I think that, um, you know, back to my conversation or like comment about if it were a baseball coach, like my parents, they love me. Yeah. They're good parents. Like they tried their best. And like Ashley has this fear and just, it's really more of an acknowledgement that, you know, our kids are going to be 
have so much blame for us and, you know, whatnot. Like no matter what you do, your kids are going to hate you for something <laughs> when you feel they get older. <laughs> for, for everything that you screwed up. But, but truly, I don't have hate or blame at all for my parents. Like they do the best they can with the information they have at the time. But I, I do look at this and look at how um, that manifested in my life. And it, it wasn't good for me. It wasn't the messaging that I needed to receive. And I do believe that at least on the shame and guilt aspect that, that this could have been a, a big changer for me, you know, in my life um, to have had that conversation and to understand like, this is what that was. And this isn't you, this isn't, there is no depravity on your part of this at all. Like, um, yeah. Versus like, maybe I caused it, maybe something about me right. made the, made the abuser want to come after me. Yeah. I mean, that's, can that be a thought that arises in a victim? Absolutely. That somehow it's the victim's fault. Right. Yeah. And, and can cause, like, I think different behavior patterns, right? Or like, oh, like, you know, for um, for somebody that was wearing a bathing suit, if something like that happened, like, oh, I, I was showing too much skin or, like, whatever it was that was, yeah, attracting that abuser, that could modify, like, their willingness to go out in a bathing suit for the rest of their life, right? Or whatever. I mean, there, there are these consequences that... Um, that come about based off of the belief systems that we form, which are based directly off of the information that we have and who talks to us and who, you know, who lets us know what's normal and not. And so much of our parenting experience is about, is about framing that for our children. The final thing. So we talked, I, I tried to process the church's unfortunate point of view, the, the abuser or the perpetrator's point of view. We talked about your point of view. The final point of view that I think bears mentioning here is the community because, you know, what was the, what was the big problem? You know, one movie I recommend for sure. One of my top 10, five to 10 most important movies of all time is a movie called spotlight. And it's about the Catholic priest pedophilia epidemic that's plagued Catholicism probably for millennia, but certainly for, the, the past 150 to 100 years, where something like six or 7% of priests were sexually abusing children across the entire world of Catholicism. And whenever a priest was found guilty of, of molestation or of abuse of kids, the priest was simply transferred to another parish and then repeated the abuses from parish to parish to parish with no accountability. The community, the, the Catholic Church's decision to cover these things up um, left the community su super vulnerable. And that's that's the fourth consideration that I think is really crucial here. And we've already touched on it, but when the church just relies, quote, on the atonement to heal and to deal with both your pain as a victim and with the sins, quote, of the perpetrator, then they're just leaving, you know, th th they're not bringing in law the, the the law enforcement services to to kind of investigate and to process these things in a way that could protect the community. They're not informing the community, both the media community of your ward and stake, so that parents can protect their children, knowing that this person is potentially a pedophile or a predator. This kid is then left to go and serve a mission. And to go on and maybe become a seminary teacher or even a bishop. And we've seen bishops who are pedophiles. We've seen missionaries who are predators. We've seen stake presidents and, and seminary teachers who are predators. And if you don't flag these potential predators early, it leaves the community vulnerable and it allows future victims to experience abuse. And that is the systemic abuse that the AP is trying to talk about, that Michael Resendez is trying to talk about as an AP reporter, and that we're seeing a level, and it's, and it's what the Boy Scouts of America has been infected by Mormon, by Mormon systemic cover-up of abuse. It infected the Boy Scouts of America 
Not that they probably didn't would have had their own problems as well, but it's led to these systems of abuse that are far more severe than just the the the, the carnage that it wreaks in the lives of the victims. It creates a systemic problem that leads to massive repetition of abuse, mm -hmm. and that's you know mm -hmm. that's also a very significant and serious serious problem that we need to call out, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. why it's why the church would pay hundreds of millions, if not billions, of penalties, because we're talking about tens, if not hundreds of thousands, of child and teenage victims within Mormonism. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I mean, I, I even look at that to the question of if the bishop had at that time. And look, I think laws in California at that time actually did prevent the bishop, which they no longer do, um, from coming out and speaking out about that. Um, but what they did not prevent is once he confessed to my dad, they didn't prevent uh, that going to the police, right? Like once, like the bishop may not be able to say anything, but if he confessed to my dad now my dad can go to the police, right? Like now my dad can do something. But then the other thing to do with that is like, how does that play out in the ward? Like, I know how it plays out yeah, in the we ward. Saw it. <laughs> we, we've lived it. And, mm -hmm. but this family, lovely family, like, um, I really, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of love for his parents and whatnot. But I mean, they were well respected. Like it would not have been, it would not have been popular. It would not have been well received. To what? To, to him calling the police. Yeah, to him. call the police. Like, why would you persecute this kid? Like, why would you ruin the rest of his life for one little mistake? Like that kind of thing. Like that is what would happen. And, um, you know, my parents, like, were not like super well established at that point. Um, in the area, in his family was. Um, and so that would have played out poorly for the family as well. And I'm not, I'm definitely not saying that my parents didn't do anything out of self-preservation. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that I also know how that would have played out in the community of the church at that time. It would not have played out well. Yeah, the the family of the abuser, their reputation gets tainted the ward ward the bishop and the ward gets tainted the state gets tainted the church gets tainted the church is vulnerable to lawsuits all the power congregates around protecting pretty much everyone but the victim well in the, but what also happens like very quickly in that system is that actually the abuser becomes the victim yeah, they now. really rally around the abuser and in his victim or his family and the ward, like the bishop, like all of them now become the victim. They're really sympathetic. If somebody speaks out, right? Like one of the things that was talked about in that article yesterday um, was that there were people that showed up at court to support the abuser. They showed up at the court to support the abuser. And so that is a consistent narrative it's happened many times. We've seen in articles, Christians and yeah, yeah, the not whole just church, our church shows up to the courthouse to support right. this abuser that they all think is amazing and well, and needs or like he he doesn't need to get railroaded, needs right? Support. Needs support. We need to support them. And so, anyways, uh, like that's another this idea of the abuser becoming the victim. I've never had it distilled for me quite, but that's another level of. Yeah, I mean, it happened right? in our case. We'll talk more about that later, but yeah. 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 Oh. But, I mean, but it, that is a consistent theme, like almost all of the time. Oh, my gosh. And so that, how the community responds around that, that is how they respond. And yeah. the, I, I, I've learned a lot about this over the last couple of years, and there's reasons for it psychologically that I, I believe. Um, but I do believe that that's how that shows up. And so I... Yeah, I mean, the, it's a systemic problem, you know, is perpetuated by mm -hmm. that. It's mm -hmm. perpetuated by, like, the way 
that, that the system is intended to be operated. And mainly religious. Yeah, I mean, there's the a, forgiveness around it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think so. Like, and so, anyways, like that. So that is a theme for me. And as I'm going throughout my teenage years, um, this thing, you know, comes to my parent, and I'm trying to figure my stuff out. And so then, I, I go through that. I keep moving on with life, um, and still struggling from time to time with, with that same issue. Like, and you know, I'm at this point, like wanting to get to a spot where I'm going to start to prepare for a mission because, you know, that's what, that's what good boys do. Like you want to go on a mission. I heard lots of stories from my dad, um, about his mission. Uh, he served in Portugal and he loved it and there was a lot of struggles, but really the struggles that he talks about really, in my mind, like, they're the hero's journey, right? Like, they are. Like, that's that's how you become a hero, right? Like that and, you know, you, you go through these painful things. You go through the hard stuff. And I, he, my dad absolutely 100% in my life was my hero. Like, and so that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a hero too. And so I'm following that path and like, I needed to figure out how to get there. And so, um, you know, my deviancy was an issue for that. And so like, I consistently would revisit that and figure out how it was, um, that I, that I could move past it. And, Mm. um, so as you know, I continue going throughout, uh, my teenage years, um, I'm consistently involved like in, you know, my leadership and my quorums and fully participatory um, in those things. I became an Eagle Scout. Um, All my sibling, my male siblings were Eagle Scouts. Um, That was very important in our household because that's, that's what you do. Like we're, we're all in, we show up, um, you know, we, we do the things that we're supposed to do. Um, and so, um, you know, as we're, as we're going throughout this process for myself, like I start dating girls a lot, like that's very important to me in my teenage years. And I, I feel like my self-esteem tied into that, um, pretty well. Like, uh, yes, I was attracted to girls. Yes. I was interested in, those kind of relationships. But honestly, I think a lot of it was from a validation standpoint. Like I really wanted um, girls to tell me that I was okay and that I was attractive and that I was worthy of love. Like, and so I had a job um, throughout most of high school, um, like from my sophomore to senior year. Um, And my major focus of my job was making enough money so that I could go out on dates whenever I wanted to. Like I could, um, you know, like that, that was always very important to me. And so as I'm, I'm going throughout my dating life, there's like a lot of girls that, um, I would say that most of the girls that were like attracted to me, like that showed a lot of interest in me, were actually not members of the church. And so like I had a couple like instances slash on again, off again um, instances with girls that were not members of the church, but that wasn't like any sort of acceptable long-term relationship. Like I could, I could kiss them once or twice or something like that and that would be fine, but it wasn't like I knew it couldn't go anywhere. And so the girls that I was super attracted to um, were the ones that resembled like the cap sleeve, you know, like super modest um, seminary class president kind of uh, situation. Like, um, and there were, we, we had such a big group of youth at the time. Like there were a lot of girls, um, you know, that, that I had different little, um, crushes on and whatnot. 
But for the most part, like that wasn't well reciprocated within um, my my seminary class or whatnot. Um, and so anyways, like, but those were the girls that I was ultimately super attracted to. And definitely the girls I would take out on a lots of dates, right? Like we'd go out on a couple dates, but it, it never materialized or whatever. So I wasn't necessarily like getting that reciprocal affection from the people um, that I was supposed to be. And so um, I worked at um, a wonderful institution um, <laughs> known as Pretzel Maker uh, in our <laughs> mall. So Pretzel Maker, it was really the the place that dreams were made. You know, like we uh, had a lot of fun there. I worked with a lot of my friends um, as a teenager. I think from the time I was yeah, yeah, like 15 to 19, like right before I left on my mission. It's like in a mall. Yeah, in a mall. Like, right, we weren't in the food court. We were adjacent to the food court. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we, first of all, like, it's a whole bunch of teenagers. That's how the model works, right? <laughs> like, you're, you're not hiring uh, $25 an hour pretzel employees. That's uh, that's not what's going on. And so, yeah. um, it, you know, I had a lot of friends that um, I was able to, to bring on board somehow, like at the beginning, I wasn't, uh, you know, obviously like a manager and like that, but you stay at the pretzel maker long enough, you rise up through the ranks pretty quickly. And, um, uh, so I did, and I was able to help hire a lot of my friends and we had a blast there. Um, but while I was doing that, um, you know, I, um, I met this girl um, who was like, I, I think at this time I was I was probably 17. I may have been 16, but 16 or 17. I was in my senior year um, of high school and um, she was 24, I believe, maybe, maybe 23, something, 23 or 24. But either way, um, she... Now, now I kind of more recognize it for what it was. Um, but, you know, we talked a lot. You know, you're working for four or five hours, and sometimes there's lulls and whatnot, so you get to know people. Um, and she, it became apparent after a little while that she was interested in me. And, you know, I'm definitely attention-seeking, and I'm not like, uh, you know, she was... Um, she was interested and I was interested in somebody being interested in me. And um, so anyways, um, things kind of progressed and um, she was grooming me. Um, and so she did. Um, and she, you know, I mean, obviously if you're working at Pretzel Maker, um, at 24, like, I mean, I don't know, like, I shouldn't say that. That's not nice. Like, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. But bottom line is, like, she didn't have a car. Like, it wasn't, like, she wasn't, like, set in life yet or anything. And so she lived, like, 15 minutes away. And um, she usually needed a mom or somebody to bring her to work. So um, she asked me one day um, if I would pick her up for work because – you know, I had a car and so I did, I drove out and picked her up and then, you know, she told me to pick her up early. So we did. Um, and we decided like on the way at this point, I hadn't like, we hadn't been physically affectionate with each other or anything. Um, but that was like, obviously the plan for me to pick her up early and we were going to go make out. Um, and so, you know, once again, at, 16, 17 years old, like you're not looking at, or I wasn't looking at this from a perspective of like, hey, she's an adult. Like, this is a problem. I was thinking like, oh, this is cool. This girl wants to make out with me. You know, awesome. Um, Tell us your, both your ages again one more time. So I, I was a senior in high school, so I don't know. 17-ish. Yeah. I, I, was, I was probably 17, um, 16 or 17, somewhere in that range, I was 16 and 17 in my senior year. Um, 
And so anyways... And she was... Uh, she was 23 or 24. Wow, okay. So she was she was quite a bit older than me. Yeah. But, like, she had been adulting for a while. Like, it wasn't like she just turned 19 or something like that. Like, she was much older than I was. Um, and so... And you feel like she was grooming you. Well, she was. In like, the, the conversations that we had leading up to this were very sexualized. Like... Um, and so she knew that I, I didn't have any sexual experience at all. Like, um, and she kind of thought that that was like cute or funny or whatever. I mean, I don't, you know, it was something in that vein. And so anyways, we stop, we go park and it, um, the making out escalates and like to the point where, um, I'm not, I'm no longer comfortable with what's going on. Like, because I'm starting to feel a lot of shame. And, um, so there is a point in the convers or in, in that situation, um, where I told her stop. Like I told her that, like, I was like, Hey, no, I, I like, I don't want to do this. Like I was, but at that point, like, it had, um, anyways, I, I don't know how graphic um, you want me to be, but it it, it had um, escalated into like um, you know, kind of starting sexual stuff as opposed to uh, like just making out. And so, like, once it progressed to that, I was like, no, like I can't. And she she didn't stop. Like she kept going. Um, and I, I felt like really horrible about that. Um, and I, I was just talking to one of my buddies that I worked with the other day who was with me that night, like after that shift. Um, and I had taken him home and I remember telling him about that. Um, and at that point, like I was, I was crying, like I felt bad about what had happened. And I wasn't feeling bad because I was registering at that time um, that I had told her to stop and that she didn't stop. Like, and in that, especially at that time, like I'm bigger than she was like, you know, I mean, I probably outweigh her by 50 pounds or something like, and so in my mind, like, you know, you tell somebody to stop, like you're, you're a grown person, like, maybe not mentally, but physically, like I could have made her stop. Um, like that's where my mind was. And so, um, I was telling him and I'm, I'm super devastated about the fact that I had just like sinned like very seriously, like so much so that I, at that point, I didn't know if like that would prevent me from going on a mission, like what exactly the implication would be, but I knew right away that I had to unburden myself. Like I needed, like it was an incessant need to go confess. Like that's the first thing um, that popped into my mind. And I was on, I, I know what time this happened, like roughly because I, I was on the youth conference committee, which in our stake, like that was kind of a big deal because like, there we had a ton of youth in our stake. Um, and so like if you were on the youth conference committee, like from a perspective of like how good you were, like in my mind, right? At least like you were a really good kid. Like if you were on the youth conference committee, you know? Um, and so that was that was an important thing to me. Well, I go in and I talk to my bishop about it and I tell him, and I did tell him like what had happened. And I did tell him like, yeah, I, I felt bad about it, but like I told her to stop and she didn't stop. Um, and he knew her age too. Like I did. Cause like afterwards I did kind of think about that a little bit more. It's like, Hey, um, you know, it's probably not good. Right. That she was a lot older than me. Um, and you know, she, she was in an active sexual relationship. Like I knew that at the time with, um, with the boyfriend, like, and so like, 
that was part of the TMI that she can, I, or like the information that she had shared with me, um, like in, in her grooming. Um, but you know, so I tell him that and his first reaction, um, you know, was not to talk to me about like anything about her fault, like, or what she had done or like, Hey, if you tell somebody to stop that, they need to stop. Like it, it wasn't, there was no conversation around this is statutory rape. This is actual rape, like nothing like that. Um, it was, the conversation was fully directed at me at like, and that, that's how I showed up. Like I was showing up to unburden myself because that's the way that I thought. Um, but ultimately like if, if I were to be in that situation today as that adult that this had been confessed to, cops, you know, like mm. right away. Like, I mean, and that kid that was 16 or 17 years old would have a conversation with me, like saying, hey, that was not appropriate. Like, it doesn't matter who or it is, what it is. Or illegal. Yeah, it was it, not only inappropriate, a crime, a crime. but yeah, it was a crime. It was illegal. Um, and... You know, so, um, but the focus was on me and, like, what I could do to repent. And I remember, like, feeling like it, the possibility of me going on a mission, like, could have been destroyed by that. And, like, that feeling of fear and loss, but also that it didn't matter what my consequence was that it had to be taken care of because that was my only way to progress towards God. Like, and I, it was my only way to feel better about myself. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of how it went. And so then directly from that, um, my bishop calls the stake president, which now in my understanding of how that's supposed to work when you're dealing with a youth, that is not the way that it's supposed to go down. Um, it, you know, if it was an elder's corner or like somebody that was an elder or older, then that's anyways, I don't, but, um, that was not what he was supposed to do. And so, but either way, um, I got released from my calling as, uh, you know, a youth conference committee member, mm. um, you know, and it's visible. Like I had been to meetings like as, uh, you know, as part of this. And so, um, and one of the odd things, too, for me at that time where I saw this or I had this kind of dissonance is I knew that there were a couple guys on the youth conference committee um, that actually, like, unashamedly had, like, sexual relationships with um, girls, and but they just didn't tell their bishop about it. Like, And so there was a little bit of that dissonance there for me at that time, mm -hmm. but I was like, you know what? This isn't about them. This is about me, right? This and is so, a situation in Mormonism and probably other traditions where the dishonest people get ahead and the honest ones are kind of punished for being honest. Yeah, for sure. And so, um, so I go. I'm going through this repentance process, and probably about four or six weeks into it, my dad approaches me, um, and he's like, "Hey, man." You know, I know. So I confessed to my dad after I confessed to the bishop. And um, as I talked to him about that, then he comes back to me later and he's like, hey, just so you know, like the way that this hand was handled was inappropriate. Um, what the bishop and state president did um, in this scenario were wrong. Um, and he's like, so if you would like to... Um, you know, still be on the youth conference committee or whatever, like I can make that happen. And I, I told him no. And I said, you know, um, if this if this is what the Lord wants from me, like if this punishment is like what I'm supposed to do, 
then that's what I want to do. I just want to be right. Like, I just want to be right with God. And so for me, like, if I were to, you know, use my my dad's ability to make things happen the way that they were supposed to happen from a context of, um, you know, knowing how the politics of the church are supposed to work and whatnot and forcing my priesthood leader to to make things happen the way that they should have, then I would have not been listening um, to what God obviously wanted from me. Like the bishop already spoke like this, the punishment had come down like that. That's just God's voice, you know, like in my mind. And so I wanted like, I wanted to go through the whole repentance process, the way that it was given to me, because that was the way that I could, could heal. Like that's the way that I would be, okay with God. And so anyways, that, that's what happened. Um, no reports to the police, no, um, nothing to do with like what maybe should, well, what should have happened. And I honestly, until last year, when I was sitting down and talking through kind of, um, some of the things that had gone on in our family's life, it was at that point that I actually realized, like, in, actual, in actuality, I was raped. Like, I couldn't even say that to myself that I was a sexual abuse victim in that instance. I, I knew that I was, like, it was statutory rape. Like, I knew that. Like, I understood what that meant. But I also, at 17 or 16, you know, you feel like you're, like, kind of like a grown person. At that time, you're like, you... I, at least I did. I, until I'm older and I'm looking at my own 16 year old, I'm like, no, that is not a grown person. Like you feel bigger than you are, or at least I did. And so from a maturity standpoint, now I look at that. I'm like, no, 16 year old. I mean, honestly, I don't think 18 is like, I know legally it's an adult, but I don't, I don't really think that way anymore. And so, but now as I, also, this was something I was so ashamed of, and I, I'm ninety percent sure that I didn't say anything about that to Ashley before we were married, because of the shame that I carried with that. Because I felt like, um, I mean, I didn't have sex with this lady, so technically, you know, um, but I was concerned as how that would be received, like if. If I was, like, if I had had any sexual experience at all, like, I didn't want that to, like, disqualify me for her approval, you know? And because that wasn't who I was. Like, in my mind, like, I'm like, I know I'm, that was, like, um, you know, I've moved on from that. I've served my mission, like, you know, whatnot. And so anyways, but that was... That was an experience that just last year I was finally able to step back and be like, wait, no, that actual actually is rape because I did say no and it did continue. And no matter like that's it, that that was the end of the story from that perspective. And I think in Mormon culture and probably in broader U.S. culture or just human culture, I think there's a double standard. Um, Well, first of all. Uh, there's just not a good awareness around consent and rape just generally. Um, but I, I, uh, so I don't know to what extent women victims fare any better than men, so to speak, because there's a huge problem with this. And I'm sure there's a lot of women who are really relating to you right now as, as having experienced the same thing as women or as young women. But I also think on top of that, there's a double standard where it's like, well, a guy can't, a guy can't be raped. Like, no, I mean, you're, you're a guy and she's shorter and smaller than you. And you probably wanted it, you know, and, and, and you could have stopped it and she couldn't have physically overpowered you. So that, you know, number one, that's not rape. And number two, no sympathy. You're a guy. I I imagine there's a double, and I know those words sound really offensive, 
but I'm trying to echo my sensibilities for culture these days. Does does that sound right? I mean, accurate? Yeah, I mean, that's the way that I thought. Like, yeah, I, was... I couldn't even, I couldn't download it that way until, like, last year. Yeah. Um, that was the first time that I was really able to say, what, what mm. they, wait, no. Yeah. Like, because my understanding around that has changed so significantly from a cognition standpoint, from a physicality standpoint, like, um, you know, the, I, I really enjoyed the episode that you guys did a little while ago with, um, with John, um, oh shoot. Larson. Larson. Um, about how people react in traumatic situations, you know, there's fight, flight, or freeze. And like, I typically end up on the fight side of that, like as like my, the way that I react, but definitely in that scenario, it was freeze. Like I froze, like Mm -hmm. that was it. I like, I, and so yes, your body continues to function. Yeah. But that does not, that's not consent. That's not what it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether, you know, my intent in parking the car with this uh, lady, like, that has nothing to do with whether or not she had the right to do what she did. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so that, I mean, that was, that was a, an experience preparatory um, to my mission, but definitely one where I decided, like, and I knew that I needed to to take whatever pain it was that was going to allow me to continue to move forward towards the mission, like, because that that was the hero's journey. Like, that's what you do. You go through the pain, you get through it, and then um, you can move on and, like, and do the things that... Um, that you're supposed to do. And Mark and I were reflecting during during a quick break that we had about how during this episode specifically, we've done some process processing about the system that in some ways kind of has paused your personal story at times to reflect on maybe where the system failed you and where it continues to fail others. And I, we, you know, we always try and say systems, not people here on Mormon Stories. And so I want to just take a second to do that again. Like if we want to think about how the Mormon church and other institutions could do better, like it wasn't until, I don't know, me like 10 years ago, as I'm doing Mormon stories interviews around rape and consent, as I'm getting my PhD in psychology in my forties by that point, and as, as family members close to me experience assault or rape, that I even start thinking about what rape is and what consent is and what sexual health is. And it was then that I just first realized, wow, when did I ever have a lesson on consent in the Mormon church ever in 45 years? When did I ever learn about the word consent? When did I ever hear, did I ever hear the word consent ever in a Mormon context ever? (laughs) And the answer is no, (laughs) right? Now, there are other religious institutions like the Unitarian Universalists who have a whole, there's a a sexual curriculum called OWL or Our Whole Lives, and they they lay it all out there, contraception, consent, everything, you know, sexual health, pleasure, STIs, they cover it all. And, you know, we didn't learn that until we were forced to kind of explore other religious traditions, that that can be a thing, that a religion can actually teach about sexual health, STIs, contraception, consent, all of that, um, that that's possible. But we're now in 2023, and I guarantee you the church has not incorporated into its young men's and young women's program, the Mormon church, I should say, any sex education. Because it's sort of like they're at sex education. The Mormon church's version of sex education is don't do it. Right? Yeah. And if you do it, you're in trouble and you're bad, but don't do it. But if you do do it, or if if you rape or assault someone, we're going to sweep it under the rug and try and pretend like it didn't happen. And that's the, ex- and, and don't do it. And don't think about it. And don't even masturbate. That's kind of 
more mature sexual health in 2023. So all I'm trying to say is the system failed you because your leaders mishandled that. It was another example of rape and or sexual assault. And it was, it was mishandled and swept under the rug by your Mormon church leaders and the church as a, now we know $250 billion organization, they can afford to develop a sexual health curriculum and to train their leaders about what rape is and isn't, what consent is and isn't, what assault is and isn't, and how to handle that with local law officials and not to beat up on whoever your bishop was. Now, that's not the point. Systems, not people. But I just want to take the time to say that was mishandled. You were not done a, a service by your by your church and by your leaders. And that's more insult on top of injury from all the other things you experienced in your adolescence. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny, too, on that, like, the messaging that I received there, you know, was like, was the, yeah, this was you, this is your fault. Um, and... Like, in this scenario, like, this person wasn't even a member of the church. Like, it would have just been super simple to report. Yeah, there's but, no one they needed to protect. Right. Mm, interesting. And so there was there was no one to protect from that perspective. But it was still, like, for my future as well, like, looking at, like, what my level of guilt should be. Like what I was taught there is my level of guilt was completely proportionate to the thing that I did, right? Like this was my fault and I should feel super horrible about it. And then I got punished accordingly, you know? And so... You were punished in, in essence for being raped. Right. Mm -hmm. Which I think women experience a lot more than men. Or at least mm -hmm. we're aware of it occurring more against young women and, and adult women than men. Yeah, But it well, still happens to men. Yeah, and so, I mean, from a, a perspective of how serious this thing is, like, um, like it, the, the part that was serious was my part, right? And so since I'm the willing punching bag in the situation, like, I'm the one that gets that. Like, there was no question, okay, well, could you give me her name? There was no question about, like, yeah. any of that. Like, what can we do from an accountability perspective for her? And so... Once again, like the victim was actually the person that was wrong. Like the victim was the one yeah. that had something to be sorry for. Um, and and that was very, very well manifested by the consequence. And because besides not being able to go on a mission, like removing me from the youth conference committee would be like the worst thing that you could do to me in the church. Like, cause at that time, like I said, I probably had, there were probably 300 youth that were my age at that time, you know? So being one of the, you know, five or eight, however many people that were in, uh, on the youth conference committee, like was, it's a bigger deal, you know? It's shaming, right? Yeah, and so being removed from it, yeah, absolutely. Huge and there shame. was some visibility to it? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, I don't think they told anybody what happened um, at all, but I w you're just gone, and you're they know that you're disappear. not on it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that what because I decided not to re-enter the youth conference committee because, like, I just didn't go for two months, and now my dad or whatever – would be able to get me back on the committee. So I'd just be popping back up even if I did go back. Yeah. But I wasn't, you know, I didn't feel like that was the right thing. I needed to take my punishment. But um, instead, when when I told him that, like what he decided is during that spring break, which is when our youth conference was held, um, that our family would go to Nauvoo instead. Mm. And so we did. We went to Nauvoo. Um, and we did a lot of church history stuff. Um out there and, um, you know, and, and that was my dad's way of, of, you know, saving me embarrassment because as, you know, in like my dad was loving me the best way that he could and he was showing me support the best way that he could. 
And that's so that's what we did. Um, so we went to Nauvoo um, for spring break, and then like then it's just a family conflict, right? Like, and so the my other siblings um, that were well, I only had one at the time that were age appropriate for youth conference. They went to Nauvoo too, mm-hmm. um, and. At that time, our youth conference was like a big deal. It was a lot of, like, for us, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was like a four- or five-day event. Like, we would stay over at different people's houses. Um, and, you know, they had, like, the big brother, big sister kind of set up. Um, so you'd be over, like, 10 other kids or 15 other kids that were in your your family. And so, anyways, it was it was a big deal in our stake. And so that was my my last youth conference after, you know, there, you, know you have – I think they were, I don't know, you have four. Yeah, like all of your high school years. And so, and I didn't attend my last youth conference. And yeah. So anyways, that's kind of, that's how that went down. And that was definitely the messaging that I received um, after that, mm. that situation. Mm. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a fun way to end your kind of teen young adult, you know, years in, is a Mormon, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it wasn't. Um, and I, I would say in general from like, a perspective of like enjoying my church, um, years as a teenager, like I did, uh, like socially, like I was, I was very interested and or plugged in with seminary, with, um, you know, just my a mutual, like the friend groups, like, um, I really enjoyed the people that I went to church with and overall, like I always really looked forward to youth conference. I really looked forward to high adventure. Um, so yeah, like that was, it was kind of a bummer. Like mm. that was, it was not a cool way, mm. um, to end up, yeah. you know, yeah, it sounds that was a punishment for sure. Yeah. 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 But I did go to after that, like I started attending pre missionary, you know, and um I had like a lot to like kind of get over, um, like at least from my perspective, like on a worthiness path to be ready to serve a mission. Um and so I'm I'm going like after that happened, I, the stake president was in my ward. Um, and so they made him my home teaching companion. And so I started getting to hang out with the stake president a lot. Like now I look back and I'm like, okay, anyways, it was, it was weird. Um, but, um, so I, I got to hang out with him and he was like, he was an Institute teacher. Like he was very, very, um, into the church and, um, like you couldn't get more churchy than he was and it, which is whatever. I mean, but at the end of the day, like I did that, I did, um, I'd go to Institute, like after I graduated high school, um, and I'd go to pre-missionary every week. And so I was intentionally preparing to serve a mission. Um, like that was, it was very important to me. Um, and so mm-hmm. that that's kind of youth wise, like that's what happened uh, after that. And then, then I got a mission call and mm. um, got to head on out. Where'd you end up serving? Um, Adelaide, Australia. Mm. And so we actually, we have a daughter named Adelaide now um, because, you know, that's what the missionaries did that served there. Yeah, they all do. <laughs> they all have Adelaide's. <laughs> this is a beautiful name. <laughs> but yeah, so that's where I served for two years. And I like, fun fact on my way up to the MTC, um, my MTC um, start date was September 12th of 2001. And mm, so. Wow. So he got to fly up the Salt Lake. And his mom and them had to drive because their ports were closed yeah. the next day. Yeah, so it was, yeah, that was a, that was that a weird. timing. That was a weird time to be leaving the United States. I can imagine. 
and my res- like the people in Australia, obviously they are allies to the United States, but I will say for the first three or four months, especially over in Australia, I would not say that we were super well received. Mm-hmm. Like the the narrative for the most part over there, especially uh, among the non-conservative people, um, was like, yeah, you guys are freaking bullies. That's why this happens. Mm, yeah. And like, I'm not saying that there was no empathy. There was. But one thing that I loved about Australia is that those people, you knock on their door and they speak their mind. They're not going to give you platitudes. They're not going to beat around the bush. They're just going to say, yeah, you're a wanker, man. Like, you guys, why are you showing up on my door? Like, um, here's what I really think. And, you know, they had all sorts of nice things to say about Joe Smith. And, um, you know, honestly, at that time, uh, for the first four to six months, like, Lots of negative things about George Bush. Like people really hated the United States over there at the time because they're thinking like, why are we getting dragged into this crap? Yeah, You know, like why do we want to be involved in this at all? You guys are the arrogant jerks. Like, And so that was that was kind of like um, my family was very Republican growing up. Um, and that was an earth shaker for me from a political standpoint. Like, that's when nuance finally started to creep in for me and be like, hey, actually, maybe there are other perspectives besides the ones uh, that I received. Um, I I mean, my dad growing up, um, you know, I mean, he has since, like, modified his political thought process. But at the time, he would always call them Democrats. You know, That's, (laughs) Mm -hmm. that's what he would say. And so, like, I still, like, that still sticks in my head. And so that was a messaging that I had received, like, liberal is bad, conservative is good. Yeah. Like, and so when I go over to this place where I think everybody loves the United States, like, everybody's going to be big fans Mm -hmm. of these Americans coming over and chatting with them, you know? Yeah, not so much. Like, I guess the rest of the world doesn't really think that we're super awesome all the time. Yeah. And so that was, it was good for me though, because I started learning that there are more views than just the, you know, yeah. conservative white hetero Mormon perspective. Yeah. And um, so nuance started to creep in because that was the beauty of serving a mission is I got to start to see people like, for who they were and for all their goodness because liberals were bad, right? Like, and, but they weren't. Like, that's what I started to find out. Like, as I started to talk to these people and have meaningful discussions with people about how and why they thought the way that they did and what they believed, um, I started to see that just because you didn't believe the same that I did didn't mean that you were bad, didn't mean that you... Yeah. Um, you know, weren't righteous or whatever. And so anyway, so that that was a really good um, thing for me. And so mission-wise, like, um, I had a good time. I enjoyed my mission. I got to do some fun things on my mission um, that not a lot of people get to. Yeah. Okay, so let's do this. This has been fascinating so far. I appreciate all the vulnerability and um, it's been so powerful, but it's also a relatively novel thing on Mormon stories to hear some of these stories we've heard before, but from a male perspective. So this has been great. Let's 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 we'll do a pause in your story for a second. Yeah, Ashley's been super patient, and Ashley, I you know we always try. You know we we really want to emphasize you know, gender equality and, and <laughs> we, we believe in making sure that women have voices here on Mormon stories. And I'll just say for this particular episode, as you both conceived it, there was going to be a preconceived emphasis more on Jared's story than on Ashley's. 
And actually, you weren't wanting to go in maybe to as much depth on on your story, at least in the earlier years. Right. And so that's, I just want people to know this isn't. <laughs> it's not like, your fault. We're not just neglecting <laughs> Ashley, but kind of by design and by her own desire. But having said that, I do want to pause and give you a chance to just tell us anything you do want to share kind of about your your Mormon upbringing adolescence, um, j- just so that we can check in with you and hear about that before we come back and, and talk briefly about your marriage before we end part one and then go to part two. Yeah. So, yeah. So I grew up about, yeah, I grew about 20 minutes away from Jared. Okay. Um, and a slightly different church situation. I mean, we, I was the oldest of four kids. Um, the church was not, we did not have big youth groups. I was usually the only one my age. Um, I'm more of a low income city, I guess. And so I feel like there wasn't as much church pressure because everyone was just happy that anyone was there, I guess, in a mm-hmm. weird way. Like, mm-hmm. so I mean, I was always on youth committee because I was the only one that was my age. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I grew up, um, my dad was an engineer. My mom was a stay at home mom. Um, my siblings are more spread out. I feel like it wasn't quite as hectic as what I hear from my husband's family growing up. We're not fighters at all. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see. I used to uh, compete in gymnastics. And then I started coaching my senior year of high school. Um, I mean, my dad was bishop when I was younger. My mm. mom, they always had a couple callings because that was just necessity mm-hmm. where we lived. Um Pretty, like, average family home evening, you know, you had a really good run for a couple of weeks and then slack off. But, you know, it was fine. And then I stayed at home for my first couple of years of college. Um, would you would you say overall your, like, early morning seminary? Did I did. Did you do that? Yep. Would, your, would you say your testimony was pretty strong by, you know, graduating high school? Yeah. Yeah. You're pretty, pretty committed. pretty committed, yeah. Pretty committed to the church. Yeah. Would you say you had overall kind of an idyllic Mormon experience or? I would, I would say so. Okay. Yeah. So by the time you graduate from high school, yeah. you're. My you're... siblings might say something else. They're quite a bit younger than me. So I don't want to speak for our whole family, but I would say yes. Okay. For me, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then when you graduated, not the BYU route. No, I, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I stayed at home and drove to, uh, just this school that was like 20 minutes away and, did that in the morning and coached gymnastics in the afternoon for about two, two and a half years. Did you compete? Um, in high school. Not for high school, but I did compete for a club. Yeah. Like statewide kind of thing? Um, I, I started competing a little later than usual because I didn't really start till later. So when you're the older one, they have like age groups. And so I always did really well because there's only like five girls over 14 doing like the certain level, you know. What were your but, favorite events? Um, vault. Vault? Yeah. Mm. I don't really have the cardio for anything else. Wait, that's where you run up and <laughs> jump <laughs> off a thing and do a bunch of flips, right? Yeah. That's fun yeah. and probably hard. Yeah. So, but I had uh, stress fractures when I was about going to senior year of high school, and I wasn't going to compete in college, so I started coaching, and I coached for up until my first daughter was born. Wow. Oh. So that became a kind of a career for you. Yeah, so I, I coached for about two and a half years. During college or high school and college. Oh, I guess it's three and a half years. And then I met Jared about when I was like 20. And then How'd after- you guys meet? You can take it. Um, so in my family, I never went to a singles ward because there wasn't one super close. So I was in the primary presidency. And Jared's brother and sister-in-law were in our, my family ward. And we did not know each other, but she called me up one day and said that her brother-in-law just got back from his mission, and would we want to go on a double date with him? And so it was a blind date. It turns out later, though, that she just didn't like the girl that Jared was going to go try to date after his mission. Okay. Because she grew up with them. It was an intervention. <laughs> yeah, I can ask you. <laughs> Something to that effect. <laughs> I see. Yes. Yeah. 
Had you dated much like in high school and uh, early adulthood? not really that I was I was pretty busy. There wasn't a lot of guys. You were, you were what? I was just really busy okay. with gymnastics okay. and there just wasn't a lot of guys. Okay. She had so a full life. I was yeah. yeah it was yeah. fine. I mean, we had your usual prom dates and stuff, but nothing. Didn't yeah. date anybody seriously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you meet a local Mormon boy. Yeah. And how'd mm -hmm. that how'd that go? Was that after was Jerry was he that just, after you'd return from the He had mission? been back for one week. Okay. Okay. Any Jared, so we paused. Uh, is there anything else worth mentioning about your mission? Uh, uh, I mean, I think just a little bit, like, I, on my mission, um, like, there were a few instances throughout my mission where I had to go confess to my mission president because, like, you know, um, masturbation. I, yeah, masturbation. Like there, I didn't have pornography, but the Woolworths catalog would uh, <laughs> come in the mail, and every once in a while, you know, <laughs> like, and so. But towards the end of my mission, I had a a new mission president, and so like I remember, um, six weeks before I was supposed to go home, um, I called him up to unburden myself one time. You know, and so I, th I think this was the first time that I ever talked to him about that issue. And I probably talked to my other mission president a few times throughout my mission, um, you know, a few slip ups or whatever. And, um, you know, he told me, he's like, Elder Jones, like, I would hate to have to send you home, um, you know, in the next six weeks, like for this issue. Like, this is a, a serious thing, and you need to get it under control. And if you have any other issues, um, I'm going to have to send you home. Whoa. Wow. And for a non-Mormon, they might have no idea what it's like to be sent home early from a Mormon mission back to your ward where everyone's going to know right. that you were sent home early, and they're going to be wondering what for, right? Right, right. I so mean, that would strike the fear of Heavenly Father into you. It did. Um, it did, and I... Didn't have another issue. <laughs> uh, I was just fine. For, I mean, that was an extreme amount of fear. Um, and my first mission president was not that way. Uh, he he viewed it like... Do yeah. your best. Yeah, it's just like, uh, you know, you can call in, or like it transfers, you can talk to me if there's a problem or whatever. So, yeah, a couple few times, like, we talked... Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't like a major thing for him. He was, he was kind of a crass guy. He was from Australia. Uh, and so every once in a while he'd, he'd call me a winker, you know, like as a, which, which in Australian means what? <laughs> yeah. A masturbator. <laughs> like, I mean, so your mission <laughs> president called you a masturbator yeah, I mean, as a joke. Cause that's a word they right. say in Australia. Yeah. yeah. And it, like he was pretty irreverent guy, relatively speaking. Um, but in general though, like I, I do remember the first time that I had an issue on my mission with that, like, I just thought that you go out and you focus on God and you pray multiple times a day and you read your scriptures every day and like that God just, you know, takes this desire away from you, I guess. I don't, I, I don't know exactly know, but that's how I expected it to manifest in my life, right? Like you show up, you do your mission, like you knock on doors, you get all your contacts, like God's going to bless you to, to figure that out. Like, you know, and... That was not the case for me. And so I was super devastated um, the first time that that was an issue for me. And the amount of guilt that I walked around with over that was, like, it was crushing. Like, it was a big deal. Mm. Um, and so, and then to have that mission president deal with it that way, like, was... It was kind of nice because I didn't feel as much pressure, even though, like... I was really good at beating myself up. I definitely didn't need a priesthood leader to do it for me um, because no matter how soft or hard, like, they would go on me, like, at the end of the day, like, I was beating myself up. And so 
Um, then to have that second mission president come in and he was my mission president for, I think four and a half months. And so, you know, we have one conversation over this and it is super serious and he's willing to send me home. And, um, so it just reconfirmed to me how bad I felt about myself because it's like, oh yes, uh, your, your other mission president probably just wasn't quite as righteous as this guy. Um, and so he knows how big a deal this is. Like he knows that this is a major, major issue that can keep you out of heaven. You know, like that's kind of why I have to experience the punishments that I do so that I can, I can go to the celestial kingdom, right? Like that's the purpose. And so uh, anyways, so that's, that's kind of how it wound up for me. It was a good mission. Um, I got, I had the ability to be a, a part of like a group of missionaries that we sang a cappella around the mission so we got to fly around the mission and do some of that fun stuff because it was like the center third of Australia. Um, and so there was a lot of distances that we got to travel to do shows for different zones and stuff. But so that was good. But that was basically it. That was kind of like the, the capstone on my mission. It's like, okay, fear of God is put into you. You go home, you get married, you have kids and life will be good. Yeah. You know? Right. And definitely one of the things that I will say, like, as I'm doing, like, my exit interview and he's talking to me about getting married, he did reference, like, my struggle that I called him about. But he told me something um, that I had already believed, I guess, but that was that, like, once you get married, this won't be a struggle for you. Like, the, that's not going to be an issue for you anymore because you're going to be married, right? Like, and you can, you know, he didn't say this, but in my mind, it's like, yeah, well, then you just have sex on demand, right? Like, you tell your wife, like, hey, you know. I, this, this, that's not how it works. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> you just tell your wife, it's time. Uh, yeah. But that, but in my mind, like, as he's telling me it's no longer going to be an issue, Um, he has no friggin' clue. Like, he has no idea about how my sexuality works, like what mm-hmm. my, any of that is. But in his mind, that's how it worked. So he was more than happy to tell me that. Um, and so that's, that's like how I left my mission. Um, and so I leave my mission. I come home, and a week later, um, I meet Miss Ashley. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, normally um, we might take time to develop your your marriage and and your Mormon journey because we're kind of trying to stay themed focused for this time. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of for the rest of this part one, kind of concentrate your story and ask you to just focus on one theme through the chronology kind of up until a few years ago, which is this history of yours of sexual shame of spiritual abuse, as I think I heard you call it, uh, in the, in our previous discussions and in the outline and of your history of, of, of rape or assault or abuse. Let's just talk about how that, if in any way um, entered into and or uh, played out in your marriage. And that can include your, your courtship, but all the way through till a few years ago when, when you found out about one of your kids experiencing abuse. So let's, let's talk about that, but let's yeah. talk about that. Let's have that be the focus yeah. for the rest of this part one, How, however that shows up in the timeline. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, we go on this blind date. Um, it goes pretty well, in my estimation. And you can tell a little more about that, or I can. I'll do it because I'm I'm all condensed the better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So we got engaged like two days later. Two days after your first date. Yes. Okay. So I guess it did go yeah. very well in your estimation. Yes. And so we got married three months later. Hmm. So you were, did, did I just hear you say you were married three months after your first date? Yes. Okay. We, well, three we months were, from the day you go home from a mission. Right. Oh, so wow. it's like two months, three weeks. Yeah. Oh. And then is there, any, is there any anything worth talking about in terms of like the standards and chastity stuff prior 
to marriage or was that not an issue? Did any of this play out? Or even how you... That you want to share. How and if you talked about this part of yourself in those or times just or did it take longer? He did tell me about his babysitter when we were engaged. He told you that he had been abused? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I did not talk to her about pornography. Um, I, I didn't because I believed what my mission president told me. Like, I just, I just thought like, okay, mm -hmm. this is a non-issue, like, or it's going to be a non-issue because like, you know, I'm going to get married and that's, it's all fixed. Everything's good. And so I didn't think that that was, um, an actual issue. And like from an actual pornography standpoint, like I hadn't seen pornography truly in years, you know, like at that point. Um, and so anyways, like, I, and I didn't, at that point, I didn't feel like I had any addiction or anything like that. That wasn't, at least in my life, that wasn't a part of the narrative yet from a church perspective. Like, I think that started entering in a little bit later into my, uh, you know, early adulthood is when that started being circulated around the church. Um, but yeah, I mean, so um, it was pretty whirlwind mm -hmm. engagement. Yeah. Uh, did you want to talk about anything during our engagement? Yeah. And so, but I mean, we got married in the... Redlands Temple. Yeah, it um, just opened. Yeah, so the day after I got home off my mission, they um, dedicated it. Um, and so we were one of the first couples to go through that. And um, that's very close to um, our home. And that was that was a special experience. I know that um, for my dad, that was a fun thing too. I know that in the local area, I hadn't realized this, but um, all these local small temples, at least in the United States, um, yeah, there's temple funds, whatever, but they raise the money locally. Like, they're like, oh, hey, um, all you members, you have the opportunity to give. And especially, like, I know my dad got a special call, you know, because he had um, some affluence, yeah. you know. And so they approach you and they're like, hey, dig deep, you know. Like, God wants this temple to be in your area, and it's going to bless people's lives, you know? And so they did. They asked him to dig deep, and he cut a big check. And and for my dad, um, and, you know, I think for a lot of the affluent members at that time, like, what a privilege um, to be able to, to be in a spot where God had given you enough money so that you could um, bless God and take care of his temple and his people. And so, so that was, I think that was exciting for, um, our, our local area. The Inland Empire is kind of like, um, the proverbial redheaded stepchild of the, uh, Southern California area. And so getting a temple in the Inland Empire was like, that was a big deal. It was really cool. Like we're not LA, we're not San Diego, we're not Orange County, but we got a temple, so that was <laughs> that was pretty. And we got one before Orange County did, right? Like only LA had a temple before there. Laguna Beach. Uh, yeah, so they they have one. They like, yeah, around in, the same time, I think. Yeah, Newport came like two years after ours. Okay, um, and so there was one in San Diego and one in LA. Um, nice. And so they were the cool kids. We were not, and now we had a temple, and so we got married there, and that was yeah. That was exciting. Um, so, t so uh, an Inland Empire represent. Uh, so, yeah. So, let's talk about how shame and abuse played out in your marriage, or if it if that was even a factor, or or was it? Yeah. Well, I mean, do you want to talk about that? Or you can start, and we'll see. Okay. Where well, we so you know, I'm. We get married. We move up to SUU uh, Cedar City. Um, and we um, pretty quickly, um, Ashley gets pregnant um, with uh, our oldest. And so, you know, at that time, at least 
the narrative that I received from the church was that there was no real good reason to put off having children. And I wanted children, and uh, Ashley did too. And so, like, it was kind of like putting off children for money, for education, for anything really wasn't, there wasn't really a good reason to do it. At least that's how I interpreted what was being said to me. I know other people at my in my time um, that did not get that same messaging, but that's what I received. And so um, we we wanted to be happy. We wanted um, God to to bless our lives, and so and to bless our family, and and that was the goal. Ultimately, like we wanted to have a lot of kids, and. So we made that decision based off of what was, what was supposed to be. And we have zero regrets on our, on our beautiful children. Like, um, but it was, it was fast, you know, like, so, um, we, we did that and probably about six months or nine months into our marriage. I don't, I don't know how long it was, but like, was my first um, instance of um, like looking at pornography um, after marriage, and it was when Jordan was on the NICU. Okay. So yes. So a year. Yeah. Yeah. So you're living up in Provo, and I'm down. Our daughter was born very early, so I was living up in Provo because she was in that hospital, and we lived in Cedar City. Yeah, and so. Um, I, I'm commuting back and forth from Cedar City. Um, yeah, cause she was there a couple months. Yeah. And so, yeah, I have, I guess, you know, I have the first instance at that time of looking at pornography, um, since I'm married. Can I just connect with you on one thing? Yeah. And this is, some people are going to say this is TMI. Again, I believe silence is the enabler and the killer and we should talk about stuff. So I, I, and I've talked about this before. I was this weird Mormon boy that actually never masturbated once before I ever got married. I don't know how that happened. It just did. But the first time I'm, 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 I'm connecting with you because the first time I did ever masturbate was when our first kid was born because like we had a healthy sex life and there was, and in my mind, it wouldn't have ever occurred to me. But then once Margie was recovering from our first child's birth. Because it's oftentimes six weeks, right? What? Like six or eight weeks. Yeah, and I had a C section, right? So, yeah. yeah. So there's a recovery. And then all this, you know, of course, it's the woman's job to meet the man's needs in Mormonism <laughs> and elsewhere. There's right? only one source. <laughs> so, so, like, you know, you go a week and then, t- you know, you're used to kind of weekly or whatever, whatever the frequency is. You're used to a certain frequency. And then you have that kid. And then all of a sudden, the. The wife needs a break, right? Needs to heal. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, boom, that's what happened to me. It's just like, whoa. And I, I just remember enormous shame and guilt about that. What just happened? That, that's, you know, in the showers, like what just happened? And for me, I, so when you say it was, is when the child was born, I'm like, I think I, I think I kind of understand what may have happened. May have happened, you know? You know? The funny thing is, I, I didn't even connect that until Ashley just said it. Like I didn't realize that that's what had happened. I mean, well, I'm not trying to project onto you. No, no, yeah. no. But sincerely, like I didn't even think. Oh yeah, like that's when it was when Jordan was in the hospital and Ashley is away from me, and I didn't, I didn't put those two things together. Mm-hmm. Sorry to like, her if she's watching this. Oh, sorry. Well, because like when 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 Ashley's like, well, she was in the NICU. My Mormon shame is like, man, what a. Because he was telling me that he was in the talking to the bishop, and I was like, why are you telling me this now? I don't care. And you're like looking at porn. (laughs) Like, there's the Mormon shame that comes in that judges that. So my brain is like, wait a minute, there's probably a reason. So I'm connecting the dots for you. You know, I mean. (laughs) <laughs> it, I mean, that's, but I didn't even realize yeah. that, like, that's when it was. I mean, I knew that it was, you know, we knew, I, all I remember is that I was living in Cedar City and I thought, once you get married, this problem goes away. Right. Right. Like, right. Well, that's what your mission president told you. That's right. Well, I mean, <laughs> and I believed him. Like, and so 
But now, like, looking back, even empathetic on 21-year-old Jared, like, Mm -hmm. yeah, like, your your little factory, you know, like, (laughs) whatever. I mean, and so I just... That that's an interesting thing, but I remember being so devastated, like because I thought, I thought that this was over, like I thought that that was never going to be a problem, like ever again in my life, and so that's the point where now, um, this shame and guilt cycle entered our marriage, um, at least from a perspective of communicating that with Ashley and um, in talking to a bishop as a married and, you know, person. And so, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so um, um, the guilt and shame just starts right back up again. But again, there's the idea of Mormonism where much is given, much is required. You're a Melchizedek priesthood holder, you're a return missionary, you've you've been endowed, now you're married, now you're a father, and you're like that's gotta feel even worse than if you're a teen, right? Oh the yeah. The guilt, the shame. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. And now you're you're like doing it to your wife. You're in I will say that is the guilt was not from me though. No. But <laughs> but he would be feeling <laughs> right, that. Right, yeah. Right? I was like, why would you go tell the bishop? Oh, wait. I was so mad. Did he tell you? Yes. Well, talk about that. Well, he told me he had talked to the bishop. Wait, how did you know that he had looked at... No, he didn't tell me that. He just told me he was talking to the bishop about that. So you went, okay, so you decided to... You're a grown... I'll swear, you're a grown-ass man, (laughs) right? Your wife just had a baby. You happen to masturbate, and you decide that you need to What? No, you have to go talk to your bishop. Like wow. that's. And I was pretty mad because I just had a baby and we we're back and forth from Cedar City and he wanted me to come meet with the bishop too with him. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Why was that your, why, well, first of all, why was it your reaction? <laughs> You're a horrible human because many Mormon women are raised, <laughs> men and women are raised to think that if you do that, you're a horrible person, an unworthy priesthood holder. And then why weren't you like, of course you need to go talk to the bishop and repent? <laughs> well, I think he'd already talked to the bishop before he told me. Okay, it was too late. I wasn't even with him, but... But why weren't you like, I'm glad you talked to the bishop? You know, that's where know. you belong. <laughs> I don't know. Were you just raised differently? I guess, Did maybe. Did you absorb different messages? Maybe. I think the girls get different messages. Okay. <laughs> so what, what so message? I don't, I don't know. I just... <laughs> I, don't I mean, the conversations that we've had since multiple times is like, hey... Like, what does that have to do with me? Like, you're, you're your own person. Like, if you, if you look at pornography or anything like that, that has nothing to do with me. Like, I mean, this, that's that's her messaging to me, right. at least on that thing. And so, and it's funny because I couldn't accept that. Like, that's not what I have been taught my whole life. Like, that's not, like, it wasn't a personal issue. It was an issue with me and God and my bishop. You know, like, that's how it had to be taken care of. And so it wasn't just so simple to say, like, yeah, I mean, that's a personal thing, like, that has nothing to do with anybody. That Because that's how, that's what she told me from the beginning. Um, and it took me... About 18 years to accept that. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, he would go that to those sense. those meetings. I don't know what they call them, but. Talk about that. So, so, so what did your bishop d- give you an assignment? So I had, yeah. So I had a, a horrible experience about six years into our marriage. Um, I was, I think I was the mission leader or the ward clerk or something like that at the time. But either way, um, I confessed to uh, Bishop when I had another, uh, it could have been coinciding with another child. Really. We had a lot of kids, <laughs> you know? I, How uh, many kids total? Uh, well, we have six. The last okay. two are adopted, though. Okay. So, yeah. okay. So the pause, you know, um, you know, <laughs> would, but it would have, there would have been four pauses in our relationship. <laughs> but I, and I, it's funny, I never even tied those things together. But, um, so I go in and I talk to, um, a bishop 
about this, and he tells me that he's like, well, you know, I think you probably have an addiction. And that was right after the church had come out with, like, this addiction recovery. Oh, I mean, I don't know if it's right after, but it was pretty soon after the church came out with their addiction recovery for pornography. Now, I just want to pause here and be really clear. Your bishop diagnoses you with an addiction. And by the way, there's no such thing really in the mental health profession as a masturbation addiction, unless you're literally, like, injuring yourself or doing it in public, like... That that's not a thing, but your bishop diagnoses you potentially as having an addiction. Can you tell us like the frequency just so that we would understand? I mean, it was like it most like there were times that maybe multiple times a week. It sometimes it would be multiple times a year. Like so, but, like, but another way to say that is you would go months without masturbating. Yeah. Sometimes multiple and, months. And yet your bishop is diagnosing you as an addict, using right. the word addict and recommending you to go to an addiction and recovery program yes. that's modeled after Alcoholics Anonymous. Correct. It's a 12-step, it's a Mormon version of a 12-step program Yes, because you're masturbating once every couple months, basically. Yeah, and like... In- some like when I would like if I would go and confess, like it was probably more than that, right? It was probably like it been a couple of few times in a month period or whatever it was. Like but it, <laughs> go, go, once a week. Right, right. Whatever. You know? <laughs> but it was it was it was you know, so it would have been weighing on me. And when something weighs on me, I don't hang around. Like I go and try <laughs> to figure out what that problem is. So if there was some week and it's like, okay, it's happened twice now, like I gotta go see the bishop. You know, like then and at that time, any time that I did it, I would go see the bishop. So the frequency, in at least in my mind, seemed like a lot because every time you work yourself up to go and talk to the bishop, it's such a shameful thing. Yeah. Like it's a major, um, like it's a major thing. And so anyways, he tells me about addiction support recovery. So I decide, OK, yeah, I'm going to go to that because I'm going to fix this problem. Well, Outside of that, um, he also gives me some punishment. And he's like, all right, well, you know, um, I'm going to put you on informal discipline. And he's like, so you can't say prayers in church and you can't take the sacrament for the next however long, four weeks, six weeks, whatever it was. Um, But, I mean, it was relatively decent amount of time. Well, sometime in that time, I just want to say, which means that when everyone's quiet, the sacraments being passed, deacons, little 12, 13 year old boys are walking around passing in these little silver trays, the bread and the water to the entire congregation, the tray is passed down the pew, the bread comes, your kids are there, your wife's there, people are behind you and in front of you. What do you have to do as a result of this punishment? You skip. Which means you take the tray and what? And you pass it to somebody else because you can't you don't, take it. So you don't what? You don't take the sacrament. You don't take the bread. You don't take the water. And you don't take the water. The and things that people can see that you're not doing, it is public shaming. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Right. That, that was, this story is mind boggling to me now. Like, but. And you're I, an adult with two children at this so, point, right? So that happened to me a few times throughout our marriage, like wow. where I had to top t- stop taking the sacrament. But this specific ward in this situation was horrendous because there was one day that I went to church and I was asked to pray three times in three different meetings. Oh. And I had to say no to prayer three times in one day. Aww. So So like hey, so like someone's getting up to Sunday school, hey, hey brother Jones, would you offer the opening prayer? And then in front of an entire <sighs> classroom of adults, you have to say what? No. I have to say sorry, I can't. Leaving them to think what? Oh. I mean, something. I did something real bad, right? I did, whatever it was, I did something oh. real bad. And then like a week later, my little brother had moved into the ward, um, and he was getting ordained to something. Uh. 
And so I, we're in this small little room with <laughs> 20 guys and their wives, like, that were getting set apart um, or whatever. Like, he was getting set apart. And so um, and so they asked me. Come on. Traditionally, come, be come on up in the yeah, circle. Yeah, come on up in the circle. Be a part of ordaining your, your brother to his new calling. And so I had to say, I'm sorry, I can't. In front of 20 in, couples. Yeah. It's like, a shame so, par- it's like a shame parade, basically. I mean, so over a few weeks, like... Uh, yeah, it was it was horrible, and so, he, uh, but I knew I knew that I was I was the problem, like it was my fault. I was paying the penance that I should be paying, like I deserved it. Um, like in my mind, that's how it worked. Like that's how God works. Like that was that's how I received that. God wanted me to feel this pain so that I wouldn't do it again, right? Like that's how how you know where you stand and like when you feel bad about this and you feel that shame, then you know, you know that it's you and that you need to correct your behavior. And then once you correct it, like that shame is going to go away and you can have, um, I heard this phrase a lot, but you can have confidence before God. Right. And so I couldn't have confidence before God when I was in this situation because I had violated his trust. And so that's that's how I was showing up in my, or uh, like what was going on for me in my church career. So then he tells me to go to this addiction support group. So I do, um, and I go every week, on and off for like ten years, um, through this program. And so you so, spent ten years in an addiction and recovery program for the reasons we've already specified. I did, and so it gets better. Worse um, or better? Well, yeah, worse. <laughs> so, I mean, I I kind of I kind of figure out a flow on that and how to kind of control my um, addiction, you know, um, and conform. Uh, and so I do. And after having success at that for a while, um, I get called in the bishopric. Um, well, we'll say during that time too, um, they have like women's or like wives groups Mm -hmm. and he really was trying to convince me to go to this wife's group. And I was like, what? I'm going to go sit and play about my husband for like two hours and everyone, you know? And so I, I never, never did. (laughs) Well, and she told me specifically (laughs) after I asked her a few times, she's like, look, um, I do not want to go to that. Because I think it will make me like you less. Like, that's what she said. (laughs) And she's like, I'm fine with you. I'm happy with you right now. You don't need to have me come to this for my help. And what I was thinking is, like, maybe somehow if she comes, this will help me more. You know, like, to be more righteous and to be a better priesthood holder. And maybe she'll pick up some things that... Like, if I'm ever going to struggle, I don't know. I don't know what I thought. I just, the other wives were there, and, you know, I thought that for some reason it was good because the church had this program for the wives to come. And so not realizing that really that program is for wives that are struggling with how to stay with their husbands because they're cheating on them with porn. Like, and so that's to help them stay together, and convince them that it's okay. You don't need to fire your husband, you know. Like, um, and she didn't have that problem. She wasn't ready to fire me. Like, she wasn't ready. So, to... and I never went. Yeah. And and and, <laughs> and we have to call this out that y'all are kind of in the ninety fifth percentile positively in this regard, mm. because I've just heard countless stories of it's it's not always the husband, but in my experience, it's predominantly the husband that in Mormonism that has found himself in this position where the wife catches him licking a porn or catches him masturbating or finds out that he's doing it and then thinks he's evil and dirty and terrible. And then he's in the dot marital dog. He's not a righteous priesthood holder and he's in the marital dog house for years, if not decades. And it can wreak destruction on people's mental health, their depression, their anxiety their marital relationship, the family dynamics, and even can end the marriage. And Ashley, I just have to ask you, 
Is it just your personality? Is there something about your upbringing? What kept you from reacting like many Mormon wives do, which is to think Jared was a horrible person and for him to, for you to seize that power dynamic and for him to be perpetually in the doghouse and you wielding, you know, either wielding that over him in terms of power or shaming him to death because you feel so terrified and disappointed in his horrific unrighteous behavior. How do you explain I don't know. that? What do you think? No, I want to hear from I don't you. know. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? Maybe I'm just more laid back. That's it? I guess. I don't know. Just the personality trait? And I'm not a guilty person myself, so I don't understand why. What do you mean? Like, I don't like, like, I would never go to the bishop for anything. Not that I did anything like terrible. Just like, it just it baffles my mind that you would go like, even like I would never... It doesn't make sense to me. You're, are you saying you don't have the heightened sense of like guilt and shame? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. It's it's not that you don't have a conscience, but yeah. it's just you're just like, you don't beat yourself up. Right. Like maybe a highly scrupulous person would. You're like, yeah, I'll try and do better instead of like, I'm the worst person ever. Yeah. Or like, hey, try and do, to him, you're like, hey, Jared, try and do better versus you're the worst person ever. Yeah. I would say that, yeah. I mean, one thing I did notice about what you were saying early a little bit is is I think one way this dynamic plays out oftentimes in Mormonism and a reason why is if you actually absorb the conditioning of like owning your partner's sexuality, like that belongs to me. So because and I'm I'm kind of your only resource. And so. I kind of have ownership. And I believe earlier you were saying, I, I kind of know it's his, like, right. or maybe he was saying that, that yeah. kind of, which is differentiation around needs and some of those things. And I wonder if that also plays into it, see? Because it's like individuation. It, there's not a buy-in for where I find where that ownership conditioning has taken place. That's when the power thing can come come in. And we can talk about sort of just the psychology around what happens when you fixate on something and whether it works, like whatever that is, whether that's, you know, masturbation or it's I want to exercise or what happens when we oftentimes the kickback that happens when we fixate. Right. And then also I've I've talked to some women that went through that the program with their husbands and be becoming gatekeepers. Then what right. happens is they become the gatekeepers. Like the babysitter. Yes. Everything. And that to me would feel very unappealing with right. the way you're describing your relationship and what and your personality and the way you kind of right? Because gatekeeping is very much around keeping tabs on and kind of controlling and getting involved in punishing and some of that stuff, I feel like. So those are some things that I can see just in what you've described as to why maybe um, it didn't sink in that conditioning part that then kicks into this reactionary yeah. place, right? Yeah, just to summarize, like we talk a lot about LGBT stuff on Mormon stories. We talk a lot about faith. This epidemic of sexual shame wreaks havoc on lives and marriages within Mormonism. And I, I don't think we talk enough about it. Yeah. Cause, cause yeah. the fact that you guys are still here together to me is kind of remarkable given the Mormon context. But anyway, I don't want to derail the conversation. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you should speak to the gatekeeping aspect of that. I don't know what you mean. I, well, I can. Okay. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, I mean, I, for a lot of years, I had Ashley, like, have a password on my phone. Like, I would either install, um, like, a, you know, like a net nanny kind of thing on my yeah, phone. Yeah, like he did that. Right. For me to do. Right. And then, or... Um, I would do the same thing, like, you know, screen time passcode kind of thing. And she would be in charge of my passcodes. And I would be like, hey, could you turn this on? And could you turn it off because I need to go on this site or whatever? And it, it was a chore for her. And yeah, I don't need another kid. Like, <laughs> No. And but it was that was damaging to our relationship. It was unappealing. Like, I mean, that that's not cool. Like she. 
she didn't care. Like I'm putting this on her, like, and she would tell me that frequently. Like when it came to that kind of stuff, she's like, we'd be at work. He's like, hey, can you turn off something app or whatever the internet or something? Yeah, and it was annoying. It was annoying. To it you. was annoying. Yes. Yeah, it was not. You know, and but like in our conversations, even too, like because. When I would tell a bishop that my wife didn't really care because they'd be like, oh, well, how did your wife feel? <laughs> and it's like, oh, she, she doesn't hear it. They're like, what? Like, that's that's weird. They're like, whoa, <laughs> well, you really hit the lottery there. You're like, you have a good wife, you <laughs> that's, know? That's true. Yes, sir. I mean, I do think that I hit the lottery. Like, Not for the reasons. That <laughs> not for the reasons that they think I did. Um, but I mean. What they were saying is how probably miserable their marriages might be. Yeah, I mean, I I don't, you know, I do know that I did have some bishops that would say weird things to me around that. Like, I had a bishop, when I talked to him about this, he's like, well, like, what kind of sex positions do you do, you know? And I was like, yes. And then he's like, and then... He was specific. He's like, well, I how, find... How in the world is that relevant to a conversation yeah, it gets, it with a better. woman bishop? <laughs> well, then he said, uh, then he's like, well, actually, like, um, uh, we, I found that it's really helpful to us um, by uh, trying different sex positions. And then he asked me, <laughs> have you ever tried doggy style? <laughs> like, that's what he said. And he's like... <laughs> that is one of my favorites. Like, so he was giving me tips and tricks on how to, I mean, mm. and so I, it was, it was. Was he basically saying, if you have better sex, you'll yes. look at less yeah, porn? Yeah, I guess. That is exactly what he was saying. <laughs> and he did, he did talk about, he used his wife's name and he's like, you know, I find when I'm nicer to my wife um, that she's more willing to have sex with me or what. Like just, <laughs> and so it was super inappropriate. It was super inappropriate. <laughs> but he did ask me specifically what sex positions we did. You know, and so like mm. it was just. Um, yeah. I did as I was talking. Like once I decided I had a bishop, like I said, that told me that I that I had an addiction or that he thought I probably had an addiction. And as I, w I went in, like, I remember I was in my mid twenties, you know, five years, six years, seven years in our marriage, something like that. When this kind of like, uh, I came to head for me and I was feeling like, okay, this guy's right. Like I, I do, I have an addiction like, because, you know, anyways, Either way, I wake up in the middle of the night, like probably 4 a.m., 5 a.m., something like, or, you know, very early. And I remember texting my dad. Um, and I texted him and asked if he was up um, and I, that I needed to talk to him. And so it was early. He was up and it was like, yeah, maybe 5 a.m., maybe even earlier. And he just happened to be up already, and he's like, come on over. And so, you know, I drive from my house four or five miles away, um, and I I just unburdened myself to him and told him, like, here's what's been going on. My bishop says he thinks I have an addiction. Um, my dad happened to be friends with this bishop that had given me the oddball um, questioning and advice. Um, and um, he was super mad about that advice. Like he was super bad about the questioning and about the advice, but he did say, I'm happy to go to this addiction support group with you. Um, and so he did, he attended with me like as a support like person for multiple months. Um, and you know, like he definitely at that point, like, in support of me showed up. He didn't show me, he didn't give me shame at that point. Like, you know, and I, and I'm not saying my dad brought me all my shame before that. I'm saying at that point, like I, I was very appreciative of the way that he showed up 
for me. But at the same time, like there was no like psychological evaluation. There wasn't like, hey, is this really an addiction or is this just like something that your bishop says? My dad was in the state presidency at the time. And so he's like, yeah, actually, I've just been put over this this group. So it's good for me to to go be there and, you know, see what's going on. And so anyways, we did that. Um, Part of what's weird about that whole deal bishops and stake presidents is I've interviewed many former bishops and former stake presidents and former stake presidency members here on Mormon stories now, and they all masturbated and pretty much all of them. So it's this weird one up power dynamic where you're thinking, Oh, thank you, Bishop for helping me or thank you stake presidency yeah. member or dad. You've, you clearly don't have this problem, but I do when in reality they do, right. they're just hiding it or, figuring out how to deal with it with their leader. But once they're bishop, it's not like the stake president's going to release him for masturbating. So they're either going to be hiding it from their stake president or in secret treatment, but still trying to help you. What a weird cluster F, you know? Yeah. Like, what an awful system. And, and can we just point out, this is all existing, like years and years and years of this patterned behavior it's created. It's like a created yeah. problem. It's not even a real problem. And <laughs> and you're working through this cycle is like second nature to you. It's like, how exhausting, how exhausting that you're, you know, you have, I'm sure your brain can take you through, but like you, you, you know, you have the incident, then you have the sh the shame and the self aggression, and the and it builds and builds, and then you have to make the appointment, and then you have to go in, and then you have to right, and then you get punished, and you have the and it just around a a created problem, yeah, a yeah. manufactured problem. Well, and then you know, like an additional part of that too in this shame and guilt cycle is you lose the spirit. Like, that's what I thought was happening to me. Like, oh, now I can't feel the spirit. And then it was tricky because what I identified as the spirit at the time, like, sometimes I would feel the spirit, like, right after, like, within an hour or something like that. I'm like, whoa, wait, this is, how does that work? And so, anyways, it was, it was a whole weird no, thing. You wouldn't thing. feel much different. You were told you would lose the, the yes. Holy Ghost. Yes. But then you kept feeling like you always felt. Yes. That must have been confusing. It was very confusing. Yeah. And so I, I finally, like, get good enough at suppressing um, these sexual feelings. And, you know, they asked me to become a facilitator um, in the program. And so I do. Uh, I, I become a facilitator. And then I get called in the bishopric um, after being facilitator for a little period of time. Which shows that... They didn't care that much, I guess. <laughs> what? <laughs> they didn't care that much. Well, which shows it was probably everyone. It was probably well, almost everyone in the... If they if they wouldn't allow someone to be in the bishopric who masturbated, they probably wouldn't have many people in the bishopric. <laughs> well, in, in my mind, like, I was looking at it from a different perspective. And I'm like... You're the person to help others. No. Well, yeah, yes, that was good, too. I, I did think that. But also, when I got called in the bishopric, I'm like, how amazing is the atonement of Jesus Christ? Mm. Like, that even I, uh, a as lowly, lowly as you. piece of crap, like, mm. the probably almost about the worst thing that you could ever do in life, like, and that's the thing that I'm overcoming, and God still loves me so much that he's going to allow my priesthood leader to have this revelation. Now, I couldn't acknowledge that I was a relatively well-spoken, like, up-and-coming white guy, like, you know, that was willing to serve, right? Like, so <laughs> you start looking at, you yeah, add we had those. A, we had a pretty small ward at the time. In, in, in a small ward. Like, you start looking at all of those factors, like, I own my own company, I was... Uh, financially capable, like as willing to serve. I was, you know, like all of those things. And Leadership it's like, skills, don't forget that. And it's like, oh, yeah. It actually, that probably would be a fine fit for that. No, it was God gave revelation to my stake president that it was okay that I served in the bishopric. Um, and so, like, that was amazing to me. Like, I, I, I was so humbled by that. And 
so, you know, and then as I'm serving as a facilitator, um, Ashley's parents get called to be the missionaries over the program. <laughs> so I'm a facilitator, right? Like I'm not the, the lowest level person, but I've now got to have a very uncomfortable conversation. With your in-laws. With my in-laws. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're going to be showing up as missionaries for this program. So I needed to go and tell my, I mean, I didn't want them to just show up. Um, so I need to go and tell my in-laws. And by the way, my stake president at that time was socially aware enough to say, Hey, we're going to be calling your in-laws to this program. (laughs) Like, is that something that you're okay with? (laughs) And my first thought was, well, if God called them to do this, (laughs) like he obviously wants me to go through this, like, it's okay with God, like, then I just need to go through the pain. Mm. And so I was willing to eat crap so that God could accomplish his purposes. And so I talked to my in-laws and I said, hey, you know, dressed them by their names and said, hey, guys, um, you know, this is an awkward conversation, but I need to have it with you. Um, I am a part of the addiction support uh, recovery group for pornography. And um, I know you guys are about to get called, you know, to to be in that position. And when you show up, you're going to see me there because I attend that. I have an addiction to pornography. And I, I actually, at that time, I would have referred to myself, I would say, like, I'm an addict. Mm-hmm like now causes me so much anger to say that Mm -hmm. Um, because there are actually people out there that are addicts, right? Like that are white knuckling it through the day um, to survive um, their addiction, you know, and to, you know, there's anyways. And while that wasn't my circumstance, that's still how I had identified myself and I needed to make sure before they showed up. Um, that they knew. Yeah. And so they, like, I, I mean, I have no clue what was said behind closed doors, but they were, like, kind to me um, about that. And, you know, and I found a lot of the leaders at that program were, like, were very empathetic. And you may totally be right, like, that it's probably because they had all <laughs> struggled with that at some point in their life. At least in their minds, you know. The um, numbers are above 90%. Right. I mean, that's what I read, yeah. like statistics that I see on it. Yeah. And so, um, but yeah, so anyways, that that being said, like, they were kind to me. Yeah. Um, and But it was still an awkward thing where once again, I got to eat crap uh, in front of people that were important to me and it did matter, but... I just, I had to do it. Mm. And so that, that was kind of like my, my last experience, um, you know, with like maybe the more public shame surrounding, um, the, you know, that. Well, we did when we adopted, oh, went gosh. through the foster care system. Yeah. You tell that story. Well, yeah. we, we had a little big gap. We couldn't have any more kids and we were basically done, but then we decided that start fostering and maybe adopt. And through that process, you have to fill out like gazillions of questionnaires. And one of them was like, have you ever seen like a therapist? Like at all? And then if you had, and what was the question exactly? The the question I think was, do you have a problem with pornography? And so Jared, of course, being very honest, checked yes. And so once you do that, it leads to a whole bunch of other long delaying processes and he had to go get a letter from a counselor. Was this LDS Family Services? It was. Okay. And he wrote this letter, which sounded terrible. I'm like, this does not help at all. We cannot take this in. <laughs> and uh, and so it delayed our adoption probably or, by about... Our licensing birth. Our licensing. Yeah, by about a year. Yeah. Um, and so he wrote this horrible letter that made it seem like 
you know, I had some crazy issues, which, and then um, I took it, the state president at that time, um, who was a business associate slash uh, friend at that time, and um, he he reached out to the counselor and was like, hey, like, we need you to to modify this. Like, this is like not... we would have like, gone to a regular counselor, they would have been like... <laughs> this is so dumb. Like, like, wait, are you the? Are you is like, the question? Have you ever seen pornography? <laughs> There's a question. Is like, is it a 17 time a day occurrence? Like, like you got a problem if it's you know um, once a month pornography looking is not is not considered a problem by anybody, yeah. right? Except for except for LDS Family Services counselor yeah. and probably evangelical Christians yeah. and Orthodox sure. Jews yeah. and you know like like there are other yeah places absolutely. in the world with fundamentalist religions but yeah. in the secular or even the progressive kind of Christian world this right. is a non-issue or science right yeah, yeah. 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 I mean right. science yeah. science I mean <laughs> who needs that stuff but I mean so when when the a uh, person that's doing our home study, like the social worker finally comes out and, you know, we've gotten this letter or whatever. And, you know, she's talking to us and she's like, um, yeah, this is not what we meant. This is not what we mean. She's <laughs> like, what we mean when we ask is like, basically they're looking if somebody has an issue with like child porn or something like that. Like, um, she's like, we're not talking about, have you ever seen porn or do you ever look at it at all? Like, that's not what this question is meant for. And so, anyways, she was kind of like... She kind of was like laughing at us, like... A little bit. <laughs> at me. And laughing at me. Yeah. Which is fair. Like, now, from my current context, I'm like, yeah, that was... But I was I was scrupulous Jared, right? Like, I was, I was just doing what I felt like I had to do. Like, I had to be completely transparent. I share all my truth. Hmm. You know, and so that's what we did. And so that was that was kind of like the last that was the last thing that really became like kind of an issue for us surrounding that. And, you know, it was an annoyance for both of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so um, as we kind of think about wrapping up this part one of the episode, you you are by the you know, Next next episode is going to be about where the sexual shame and 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 abuse and all that rears its head as you now as it becomes multi generational as faithful attending devoted committed members you have to after all this decades of shame and dysfunction you experience a kid starting to enter the same cycle that you entered. Um, is there anything else you want to share to close out part one? How many total years were you married before you, you found out about your a kid being abused? Uh, 18, 17. Okay. Yeah. So you guys did this thing for about 18 years. Is there anything else you want to say about how the sexual shame and abuse affected your, your marriage before we kind of wrap up this part one? Or did we pretty much cover it? No, I mean, I, I really think that that's coming into that. Yeah, I think that's basically it. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask one thing. And Ashley, I know you're, um, uh, you know, I, I get the sense you're a little more private than, than Jared. Yes. Um, th there is this idea that we refer to that it's the woman's job to satisfy the husband, um, which, of course, is problematic for at least two reasons. One is that shouldn't be your job. And then two, it ignores the fact that you might also have needs and desires and be a sexual being as well. I mean, of course, Mormonism just tends to ignore that, period. Do you want to say anything about what, it, what, it, and then adding to that, this idea of policing your husband's sexuality and being the cop and how all of that probably makes whatever problem the church wants to get rid of makes it all worse. But is there anything you want to say about how all of this affected you in I mean in it definitely life. affected like our sex life. I mean, there's so much pressure. I mean, that's that's really all I guess I would 
So, yeah. Did, did all of this stuff just made, made, made it hard to have a healthy sex life? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then what about just affecting your marital dynamics? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I just, I didn't feel like I needed to be in charge of his life. Like, like he's a big boy. Like, I shouldn't have to, like, type in a password every time he needs to use the internet. Like, that's a hassle. Like... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know. So, but. <laughs> so was it sad for you? Was it hard for you? Was it emotional? I mean, like the actual like pornography and stuff, that wasn't the problem. The problem was that he would bring all of this in. And yeah, it was stressful. Yeah. And was there points where you're just like, well, this guy's to stop, like Bishop, cut it out or... Stop going to these ARP programs or like. Well, I mean, I look, told him many times, like, why would you go talk to the bishop? Really? Yes. So you just wished he would just stop going to the bishop, stop yeah. doing this ARP stuff. And yeah, just, stop this whole cycle of up and down. And You were the only sane one in the building, basically. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone ignored you. Honestly, I, I came to realization um, last year about this and I, lots of frustration around it because, you know, I, I, as I start having a faith transition, I'm analyzing what's gone on. And I'm like, this is crap. And I was telling her, I was like, nobody like around me said it like, Hey, do you think you really have an addiction based off of, you know, like, at least that's the way that I felt. Like I didn't have people standing up around me and saying, Hey buddy, this is, be, and honestly, like, as I did tell a decent amount of people that were close to me about this. And as I'm telling this to Ashley, I'm like, nobody stood up around me and said, like, hey, I don't think you have an addiction. Like, I think this is crap. And she's like, I did. Like, I was the one. And she mm -hmm. was right. Like, mm -hmm. she had. She had told me throughout our entire marriage. And I didn't listen once. Like, because it couldn't be. Like, the messaging came directly from the brethren. Like, this was the most important thing since I was, like, 12 years old. Like, I heard it at all the conferences, um, all the state conferences, lots of, lots of other messaging and meeting. And so I couldn't even accept that that was the case. And so that was an epiphany for me. And I was like, this is... This is so wild that I've been undergoing this. And that's why I say spiritual abuse, right? Because, like, I kept being victimized over and over, at least now in my my current frame of reference, uh, by the system. Mm -hmm. And I have the closest person to me that I share every um, thing in my life with that was telling me, like, this is crazy. Like, why do you keep doing this to yourself? And I, I couldn't even hear it. Yeah, better. Because I'm a woman, is that why? What's that? There? What's that? Say, say it again. Yeah. What, what I was that? just joking, because I'm a woman. Well, I mean, I... Half I, joking. I, I've had to learn this with Margie in my own marriage. I'm going to say it. As a Mormon man... The last person whose opinions matter is a woman. Yeah. Absolutely last. I I actually, I don't disagree that that was the way that I was. Well, you hold more importance to them, to like your bishop or somebody. Yeah, it'd be your state president. Yeah. It'd be the general. It'd be the Jesus, God. Let me tell you all the people that would be more important than a woman, right? God, Jesus, Holy Ghost, the prophet, past, present, future, the quorum of the 15, all the general authorities, your bishop, all the stake high counselors, your, you, you know, did I say stake president? All the stake high counselors. The deacon's quorum president. Yeah. Really. I mean. <laughs> your, your dad, you know, your, your your bishop, the bishop, Rick, and elders quorum president, yourself, all of them are in line before your wife in, yeah. in importance. That's so, that's so effed up. Like, that's... 
But that is, there, there's no question. Like, I, I absolutely, I, I couldn't hear it. And so that, that was, that was something that changed. That's what changed for me. When I started going through a faith transition, that is what changed. That's a good cliffhanger <laughs> for part two. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And it's very vulnerable and important that you both are willing to tell the story. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Marty, any final thoughts? I think I'm ready for part two. You ready? All right. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for part one. Uh, and yeah, we're going to be talking, we're going to be, going to be coming right back to talk about the multi-generational aspects of this as they're living their Mormon life. And then all of a sudden they start seeing the pattern repeat with one of their own children. And we'll just talk about what happens when you find out your child, Mormon child has experienced abuse within a Mormon context. How does your leadership uh, handle it? And when you have your own history of uh, experiencing abuse, how triggering that is to see uh, those patterns repeat multi-generationally multi -generationally with your own children. So that's what we're going to be talking about, part two. Uh, so thanks again, uh, Jared and Ashley Jones, for being a part of Mormon mm -hmm. Stories, for being so vul vulnerable, for sharing your story. And we're excited to have you back for the conclusion of your story. Thanks yeah, so much. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks everyone for joining us today on Mormon Stories. If you support this type of programming, uh, we need your support. So please go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor, and we'll keep providing this type of content to you. If you value it, please subscribe on YouTube. Uh, we need your subscriptions there. Like our stuff. You can give us super chat donations to YouTube if you want. You can also follow us on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and uh, we just appreciate your support. And mostly just if you think, if you know anyone who could benefit from this amazing story, please share it because uh, that's uh, that's the most powerful way you can help others. And of course, email us at mormonstories at gmail.com if you have any feedback. Thanks, everybody. You guys take care, and we'll see you for part two on the flip side. Bye, everybody. <laughs>